What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Team Never Quit podcast. As always, thank you guys for listening and watching, and please don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button if you'd like to see the show. So today, before we get to our special guest, let's kick it off with our usual Patreon question of the day. And today we have... So we all know that parents tell their kids innocent little lies to get them to behave, listen, etc. What's the most ridiculous thing that you believed when you were a kid? And what's the most ridiculous thing that you've told? I have mine. When I was told this when I was a kid because I like to play outside. I was always the kid playing in the dirt outside. And I was told if I didn't wash underneath my fingernails, worms would grow in them. So I had to wash underneath my fingernails every day when I came inside. <laughs> and when I tell that to my kids, I tell them the same thing. I told Hunter the same thing. Yep, I learned little. that one from her too. <laughs> that worms would grow out from your fingernails if you didn't wash it. And another one, if you didn't clean the inside of your ears, then potatoes would grow out of your head. Yes, I did I tell that. that. One, but... I was told that as a kid and I I do tell my kids. I'm trying to reach deep for one. <laughs> Mine was a bubble gum. Like you swallow bubble oh, gum. Oh, seven years in your gut. Yeah. 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 True. That it would just kind of build up in there, and I was. If you watch TV too much, you'll go blind. Or if you, yeah, if you, if you, if you make this face, it'll stick. Yeah, don't make faces like that. Because I used to. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've, as a kid, make faces at people, and like it's gonna stick like that. You keep doing that. I, th- I think we should I do change. I tell Axe because Axe tends to like, not being mean, but in the car, he'll see someone and kind of like make fun of them a little bit. And I always tell him whatever he's making fun of, his kid's gonna turn out that way. So it's horrifying. It's just my way. It's horrifying. horrifying. (laughs) Telling him not to do it. I I hit him with is if you if you open your mouth in a negative way about somebody at that moment there's somebody else talking shit about you. Mm -hmm. Automatically. Which is probably true. That's absolutely a fact. Uh, Yeah, 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 I believe that wholeheartedly. Yeah. Which is why when you throw stuff out in a good way and everything and you let the stuff pass. Isn't there a monster that lives in your nose if you pick your nose too big and bite? <laughs> I'm sorry, they're randomly coming into my head now. That the the bubble like... gum thing made me think of the watermelon seed because yep, I always don't swallow. Yeah, seeds don't swallow. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot about that one. Yeah, I remember Addy being like four and sincerely being worried that a tree was going to grow from her um, belly because she had eaten some side of some sort of. <laughs> Mom, we have to get it checked out. Yeah, like I, I think need I might have to been go. a pretty gullible kid too. You know, I kind of fell for most of that stuff, especially as someone who sold it to me. Yeah, those are good. That's a good question. Well, nowadays it's like the elf on the shelf is the biggest yes. lie that I tell my kids. You it's know, not like a they, lie. they won't. Well, yeah, the elf's always <laughs> watching Susie. <laughs> so you're gonna get you know bad report to Santa because you know Santa was the the our deal. We didn't have elf on the shelf as a kid. Yeah. But nowadays it's such a huge cultural shift, and mm-hmm. now there's always a little doll watching you. <laughs> Back in our day, it was hey. Find my keys you know or something that our parents had misplaced every day yeah that's how it all started the elf on the shelf has worn my ass out i'm i'm at the cusp of it being but now marcus took over 100 percent, so i don't have to do it but axon out of your 11 and 12 Mm -hmm. i feel like it should be well then you start shifting to where it's more fun than just adventurous yeah and so it becomes like a prank type deal my kids are still kind of young, so they like to see the, the fun stuff. But yeah. you know, once you stop believing in miracles, miracles cease to exist. <laughs> yeah. What, what? Why are we even talking about this? Madness. <laughs> Marcus loves it. Yeah. Yeah. Are you kidding? But no. Yeah. What, are you, he, what are we even talking about here? Next he does question. He the elf on this show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. Thanks for coming on and doing this. Mm-hmm. Thanks for being here. My pleasure, man. It's been a minute. You look Hi, good, man. though. Thanks. You're welcome. It's broccoli, spinach. <laughs> Happy New Year, too, 2024. 2024. What would 2023 do to you? Ups and downs, man. I had some uh, lost opportunities and gained opportunities. Yeah. But, uh, Feels like our life. Yeah. No, every year, you know, you got you can take it good with the bad, but uh, obviously the, the good's going to want to stick out the most. So um, got a new job and position, uh, TBRS Group, with uh, DJ and Cole running their Train crew, yeah, yeah. Yeah, run their train I've been hearing great things about that. Mm-hmm. Dude, yeah, I didn't know training. you were tied in with that. Yeah, so they brought me on when they started, because they initially wanted to do training, but then COVID hit, and they got into gear and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But everybody hits them up about training. 
So they started off with their, their knowledge transfer courses, their KTC courses. Um, and they had this whole plan, which was awesome, the way they run it. It's not just training. It's like the, the environment they create while we train. Um, you know, they call it the, the perfect training day. Like we wake up, we do fitness. Yeah. Um, we eat breakfast together, you know, as it, as like basically. It works. Yeah, it works. No, the guys, it absolutely works. And I think we should, st- we, we, I'm, cause I'm getting back on my routine as well. And it, it feels like I'm happier that way. Oh yeah. Oh, routines keep, keep the body ground and keep everybody happy. So you're running that training program? Yep. So now I'm the director of training and development, fancy title for, Hey Joe, you're running all the training. So. All right. So, so let's, let's back this up, man. Let's tell everybody where you come from. Cause the best part about when seals come on the program is like, it doesn't matter we, we're going to find out about you. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, man, I'll run into some of our guys. I didn't even know their first name. I've known you for, for almost 30 years. Yeah. And like, we don't know their names. <laughs> How great is that? Yeah. No, there's a I mean, it's the greatest community to, to, to be a part of. I, I thought it was the best fraternity. It was worth every scratch of pain that we had to go through just to get, just to get it. I don't know. I, I, I wholeheartedly. I've, I've seen and the longer I'm out, the more I appreciate that. Yeah. And the longer I'm out, the more I appreciate the length of our ass kicking. It's hard to understand that in the beginning, but like with any team guy, remember Buds? The day we graduated from Buds, you were like, oh, it was awesome. Yeah, it just kept going. Though. It just kept going, right? <laughs> it never stopped. So where, where were you born? Odessa, Texas. Yeah, you was tough coming yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> you were tough so, coming out. Freaking Odessa yeah. boys. I mean, my, that's, uh, that's over there. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I, didn't, I don't remember Odessa because uh, my brother and I were born there and we shifted to Austin area where my sister was born, but uh, I know- so you got two siblings? I had two siblings, I had an older brother. Dennis, who lives in uh, Wichita Falls area right now. What's he do? Right now, he's a police officer. He's a oh, oh, you're, deputy. Oh, you've got a service family. Yeah. All of you. Well. Pretty much. Yeah. You know, my sister's, uh, she lives actually not too far from here in Cypress area. She's a physical therapist assistant. That's service. Yeah. Same thing, man. But, uh, no, nah, my older brother used to be a truck driver, got tired of that, and uh, decided to, at the young age of 40, go through the police academy and be a Deputy at us. Does he have some good stories being a truck driver? I've never actually oh, yeah. sat down with a truck oh, driver he's and got, talked to him. He's got all kinds of I mean, like stories. team guy type stuff, right? I oh, yeah. it's, it's, it is, right? Just as gross. It, that's where I was going with yeah. that. I bet there is some, because you're elevated position. Yeah. And when you see, you don't realize it until you've actually ridden in one of them things. Yeah. They I, own I, the roads for sure. Yeah. And there's the, the, the randomness that happens on the public highways. <laughs> you think like, has there ever been a book yeah. written from some of them guys about no. what they is there, is there a cha- like an app you can go to That'd that tells great. their, I mean, think about that. Like where you could plug it. It used to be the CB. Yeah. You could just drill down the road and hear them talking all day and laugh. I mean, that was ours. I was sitting at the table the other day with a bunch of team guys that are from this area. And we all talked about putting CBs back on our trucks. We need to. It's the greatest way of communication. Okay. So, so Odessa. Yeah. He, you got so born in Odessa. Austin. We moved to Austin for a short amount of time where my sister was born. Um, we ended up in the Burnett area. About four, my mom developed uh, cervical cancer and uh, she went through all the treatment process and stuff like that. Uh, and she ended up passing away. Uh, I was at about five. Wow. Um, I remember that because she was about 33 at the time. My dad was about 34. And, uh, you know, I was four. My brother was five. My little sister was two. So we went and stayed with uh, a lady from our church while they did her process and, and burial stuff. Like we didn't get to go to her, her burial. So I didn't really put anything together until we came back and lived with our dad. We moved from the house we were at into another smaller house. Um, and we, we'd always pray before we ate. Um, we'd always you know pray for our mom, like hope she gets better or whatever. And he kind of broke down one day and he's like, hey, your mom's not coming back. Uh, she passed away. I remember that conversation. We were having macaroni and cheese because uh, that was a staple in the house at the time. Um, and my father took it real hard. Uh, kind of got into alcohol, hardcore. Uh, and then shortly after that, the state of Texas came and picked us up. And, oh, real hardcore. Yeah. Like, he couldn't take care of us anymore. Um, and the state of Texas came and picked us up and put us into CPS foster care. It was about four and a half, five years old. When you were five? Yeah. Until how old? Graduated high school. Oh, the whole system? Whole system. Talk about that. I can remember the day I got picked up. Uh, I was in kindergarten, so we did half days. I got out at noon. Uh, they went and picked up my little sister from pre-K. It's called a Head Start program. And then my brother from the first grade, because he got out of school later, they thought we got out of school together. Uh, I used to ride my bike to school, believe it or not, kindergarten, five. Bike that was too big for me. But I remember was, we could do that, too. I know, can't do that anymore. In kindergarten? Yeah, kindergarten. I, it was like four or five blocks away. Well. Um Rode back. Uh, the house was empty. I remember that being a great adventure too. 
It was like a huge deal. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, they were always building stuff, and so I had dirt mounds everywhere. Same with us on the side of the road when they were yeah. working on the road. And you, Sweet jumps freaking everywhere. Texas, man. Sweet yeah. jumps everywhere. Uh, so, no, uh, I, I was used to that. Every day I'd get out at noon because kindergarten was half day at the, the school I went to. Um, I'd ride my bike back, and the house was usually empty because my dad was a mechanic at the time, and he usually would work until my sister got done with her school. It's like 2.33, and Dennis would just, my older brother, would ride his bike home when he got done. Um, How many years older is he than you? Just one. Okay, check. Yep. So, yeah, uh, four o'clock rolled around. It was late. It started getting dark, and I was sitting at home by myself. Uh, my dad comes in a panic, comes in the house. He's all like, hey, they took Dennis and Tiffany. We got to go. And I didn't know who they were. And I didn't know what was going on. So we piled in the yellow station wagon, and we were pointed towards Oklahoma because that's where my aunt and uncle lived. Um, and we started driving uh, like an hour or so into it. He... He seemed like he'd been drinking a little bit, so he kind of stopped on the side of the road, breaking down, crying. I'm sitting there in the front seat because that's back in the day. There's no such thing as car seats, and kids can sit where they want. There was car seats. There's a bunch of them in there, right? Yeah, yeah. same thing. Yeah, it's like free for all, pretty much. Right, standing up. Yeah. So he turned rack around. We went to the neighbor's house behind us, um, and then the next morning, CPS showed up with the cops and picked me up and went into foster care. What's that like? Uh, it was scary because um, they're not mean to you. It's different normally when the cops show up and you know when you're when they're like get in the car. Yeah, I've had that happen. Yeah, and we have too when you get old when you were older. Yeah, but I mean when you're when you're young and you're scared to death as a kid, you don't know what's going on. You forget that when you get older. Yeah, no, but I, you remember it very vividly. I do. It was it was weird because I was sleeping in the living room at the neighbor's house behind us. Lights, you know, flashing lights were through the window. It was early in the morning, like five six o'clock in the morning. Um, you know, knock at the door, official police knock. Um, neighbor opened it up and, you know, they talked a little bit and pointed towards me and they kind of come talk to me. He's like, hey, we're going to want to take you and take you to your home, take you to your brother and sister. Um, and that's it. Loaded up into a car and went to an emergency shelter. But uh, Dennis and Tiffany were not there. They were at a different place. Uh, so so first, by yourself or you got somebody with you? No, I was by myself. Went to emergency shelter. They just sit you down there and... Uh, yeah, uh, they just kind of, hey, here's your bed. Um, I know you don't have any belongings because you just got taken from your home, so uh, we'll decide what we're going to do with you later. Most shelters, it's just like a temporary place yeah. before they place a kid or figure out what's going on with it. It's like when the weather goes bad, right? And everybody yeah. moves in. Are there just, rooms or is it like a large uh, room like with a, cots? No, it was, it's, I, was, the, I remember there were bunk beds and stuff. It was just like a group home type setting or like a summer camp, I guess. Um, just a building full of rooms and mm -hmm. big kitchen and whatnot. Um, I don't remember the exact location of the marriage shelter, but I remember it. I remember walking through there. I remember getting a bunk bed. had a bottom one. Uh, yeah, and just didn't go to school for a while. Didn't know what's going on for a while. When was the next time you saw your siblings? Uh, a few years after that. Uh, I mean, we had wow. visits and stuff, but um, like we were in different locations because at first they're, you know, it's it's a temporary placing because they wanted to shake my dad and like, hey, can you straighten out your shit when your kid's back? Um, so a few years went by where, you know, we had visitations with our dad. Uh, he was supposed to be working towards, you know, making a home better for us. Uh, we actually went back temporarily for a week or two to kind of have a, a home visit. Um, but eventually that didn't work out and, uh, he ended up losing his parental rights and we got placed in the permanent foster care system. But, uh, the first time, uh, I got to see and be actually with my brother and sister was, uh, beginning of second grade. Cause I remember the home, it was an Axtell, uh, uh, family, uh, the Mosleys, the name of the foster home. Um, but no, it was like after our dad finally lost his rights and they placed all three of us together in a home. Mm. That's so hard because at one moment you're happy that you're going to be with your siblings, but you also are never going to be with your dad again. Yeah, that was tough. Uh, I always was kind of in deni deniability a little bit. I always thought he was off doing some, you know, secret spy stuff or whatever. I always made up stories in my head like, oh, he'll eventually get back. Um, but, you know, he, he never did. He kind of, once he got his rights terminated, he went on his own path and uh, started mine in the foster care system. Wow. Good oh, family? Did you linked up with a good family? Uh, yeah, they were a good family. Um, just a temporary one because after your parents' rights get terminated, they start looking for adoption homes because uh, yeah. we were still pretty young. Um, so from second grade to start of the fifth grade, my fifth grade year, uh, we were with that family and then we were up for adoption. So Wednesday's, Wednesday's kid got to stand on the news, 
talk about all the dreams and hopes I had in an adoption home. Um, yeah, and then the home opened up that wanted three kids, and uh, where they said they wanted three kids, so we went and tried them out, and uh, there's like a six month stay period, uh, and at that time, it went in after about six months. They kind of were like, "Hey, we want the girl, but we don't want the boys." Um, so we went, all three of us went back into foster care. They were trying to keep us all three together. Right, yeah. So, I mean, after that, uh, bounced around to a bunch of other foster homes, uh, put us up for adoption again, kind of a similar situation. Uh, my little sister was about eight at the time. I was about 12, 13. My brother's a little older. Um, another home wanted us, uh, but they actually just wanted my sister again. So six months went by. They were like, hey, um, we just want the little girl. We don't want the boys. Uh, that was like the first man conversation I had with an adult. Uh, they were like, hey, uh, we can put all three of you back into foster care um, or you guys can let your little sister get adopted and you guys can go back in foster care. Um, so my brother and I, well, that's easy. You know, let her go have a family. Right. So 12, 13 years old, we're back into foster care again. So we bounced around. What was bunch her of, response uh, to that? Uh, she was still kind of young. So, I um, mean, she, she was- had a good family though? No, it's 50-50. Yeah. And they weren't a bad family, but they weren't the greatest either. Sure. Uh, but um, the opportunity for her to actually have a family was something that Dennis and I really wanted for her. So uh, we were like, yeah, I mean, we're not going to mess up her opportunity just because we're being selfish and drag her to a bunch of foster homes again. But now I bounced around a bunch of different other foster homes until I was 18 and graduated out of high school. So how did, when did you get linked up with a CASA worker? Because a lot of people don't know about the CASA system, but it's actually like a third party advocate for you, right? Yeah. So my last foster home I was in, um, I actually moved into that foster home from another one uh, because there was a whole lot of stuff going on my junior year where I was like, hey, I want to apply to colleges and stuff. I was all focused on uh, becoming a doctor. Like I want to be a pediatrician. Um, the foster home I was at uh, didn't wasn't really focused on helping kids. It was more like a paycheck, so you actually get paid per foster kid you get, right, yeah. and there's level of cares to that. Um, and so they wouldn't take me to anywhere to get testing, and I couldn't apply to any colleges. I didn't have a job, didn't have a driver's license. I was like 17 at the time. Um, and I started getting in a little bit of trouble to kind of get kicked out of that home. Uh, but the, some of the notes and stuff they were kind of portraying to the state of Texas – bumped up my level of care a little too high and they were trying to submit me into a hospital. Um, the notes that they were taking, the progress notes, uh, they kind of inflated a little bit and lied about some of the behaviors I was having, saying that I was suicidal and that I was molesting animals and stuff, uh, which 100% was not true. Uh, the foster home that took me in was my baseball coach. That was a foster home in that same community. And it was like, they were like, hey, we know Joey. This is, this is not him. Like, what is this crap? I'm like, well, we have to, you know, full disclosure since you guys are, you know, trying to take this kid in your home. And they're like, well, screw that. We'll take him. And you guys are going to screw his whole life up. Like, he's a straight A student. Like, I was really good in school. That, that was my, all the foster homes I went to because I went to, you know, dozens and dozens of homes. That was like my own grounding was to go to school. Like, school was my normal, normal, yeah. normalcy, mm -hmm. I guess, the best way to put it. So I love school. I love going to school. I love the teachers. Um, I was never too much trouble in school. School was super easy for me. So I had really good grades despite bouncing around from district to district. Were you with your brother at the time? Uh, no, uh, I was completely by myself at that time. My brother was in a completely different spot um, in a different home. Um, my sister was uh, at the adoption home. So no, the, the last family that I stayed with uh Probably, I still call them to this day. I call them my parents, uh, Wayne and Kathy. They live in Lomita, which is near Lamp Passes. Um, now they, they took me in. Is that uh, neighborhood farm? Little farm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 800 people in the whole town. Yeah. It is out there by Lamp Passes. Yeah. yeah. Tiny, tiny little town. Now they took me up, uh, helped me, you know, work on the ranch and, and get a job. And I actually got my first savings account and ended up taking my SATs and ACTs and crush those because I got accepted to Texas A&M. The... Good for you. Nice. It's a country Harvard. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> that's, that, was, that was Dude, that was my hey, goal. That's our school. I mean, I'm, this is a den full of tigers, but you got an Aggie over here too. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> I also got accepted into their pre-med program. Uh, so when I graduated high school, I went straight to A&M. Did you have a scholarship going in? I did. had a bunch of scholarships, actually. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Did you play sports growing up? 
I did. Uh, not in individual sports. I was skinny, skinny. Like my senior year, I weighed in at a, at a hefty 140 soaking wet. Yeah, uh, good for you. 5'11", you know, just I, I wouldn't play in individual sports because I was always like, I'm not going to play track and field because I'm never going to win first place because all these naturally talented you know, athletes that played, but I played team sports. So the football, baseball, basketball, were which the, is big. Yeah. Yeah, Lomita, in that area. Yeah, Texas, yeah, Central Texas. So um, now those are the top three sports usually all around the state of Texas. Mm-hmm. Like if you don't play one of those three sports, you're looked at as a weirdo. Yeah. So I played all three of them. <laughs> you got something. Yeah. Like, what the hell's wrong with you? Yeah. Are you... Hunter did that too. He's on that. So I, I played all <laughs> all three of them. Make sure you play all three just to yeah. win. Yeah. So I can. It was tough. I was constantly the new kid. Like my average stay at a home was probably six months. Um, shortest was the weekend. But they try to keep you at the same school. No, no, it no, was all, to, over, all over Central so Texas. So you're a military brat without being a military brat. And that's why I took the military so easily. Like, it was comforting, you know, getting, you know, orders and moving around and so, deploying and whatnot. Like, it was never... No big deal. Thing. Yeah. but Same concept. I mean, I never thought about it like that. You're at A&M. Did it, how, what's the trajectory of that? Because you ended up in the military. Uh, so the military wasn't ever on my radar. But uh, I did have, like, a like internal plan. Like, hey, because... When I graduated high school, I didn't have anything. Like I didn't have, you know, parents lean on if I was in financial trouble, whatnot. I basically started working for the cafeteria at Texas A&M so I could eat, get free food when you work at the cafeteria there. So right, the Sabisa Dining Hall was actually did really well there, and then ended up driving buses for the college because they paid a little more. Um, I, military wasn't even on my radar really because I was maintaining what I needed to do. What year is this? Two thousand one. Sure. To two thousand three. Uh, uh, all I had to do was earn money to pay for my truck. The only possession I had that had a monthly payment was my pickup truck. Um, did you live on campus? I lived on campus, yeah. Were you? Did you live in the dorms? I did, McKinnis. Were you a um, RA? No. I used, to give, I used to give my RA so much crap, though. I bet. That's where I'm going with it because you're a team guy, so I'm just curious yeah. as to how, how it played out. Cause, and you, you were majoring in what? Biomedical science. I was just online looking at some of the degree fields at A&M and they have that in-med, yep. in, Master's of in, Engineering and Engineering and Medical. Marcus just, wants to do that. I'm going to think about it. Not, <laughs> I called Lyons. I called one of our buddy, our teammates yesterday. He's a surgeon down in Houston right now. And I, I was asking him about it. I was like, hey, man, I saw this little in-med program on the, at A&M. He's like, some of them boys work next door. He's like, it's pretty cool. Engineering and medical. Yeah, that'd be cool. All right, go ahead. So, yeah, so yeah. No, uh, I, if you're not into the military... Because I, I kind of wasn't, wasn't either. And this is where I, I'm getting curious. I've started asking team guys this, only for nostalgic purposes. Like, what got you into the team thing? How did you even hear about our, our fraternity? I didn't know what a Navy SEAL was when it hurt me. Because the core at A&M is huge. Did yeah. you, they oh, weren't yeah. rattling uh, your so, cage or anything? No, like they did. Okay, um, check. So my, my buddy that I went to high school with graduated a year before me. He went and immediately went to the core cadets. Um, and then me and the guy that graduated second in our class, because I graduated third, um, we uh, at A and M? No, it, at, at oh, high like, school. No. Damn, you're that smart. <laughs> well, I, I graduated, you know, sum cum laude eventually. Well, good for you, man. But, you know what? <laughs> Freaking good for yeah. you. <laughs> that was like 20 years later. But you know, nobody keeps up with that kind of time. That's good yeah, stuff. Exactly. Bro. He he was in the core. So when I first got to Texas A and M, I was like, I don't want to do with core. Like I just want to let my hair down and and do my own thing. And uh, I found myself just not knowing what to do with myself half the time. Like I'd work, I'd study. Did you get a counselor when you went in? No. You just kind of did it on your own? That's yeah. what I did in my undergrad. I feel as if you, when you get to the university, giving advice back to ourselves now, yeah. I'm like, the first thing when you do when you get there is find a counselor. Yeah. Or somebody. Somebody. Like, yeah. No, I was, I was free balling it. Yeah, me much. too, man. Um, not saying it's not a good time though. No, it was great. I enjoyed college. Uh, but after about two months in the college, um, I went and was like, hey, I want to do I want to do the core cadets. So I got a hold of my buddy who was already been in for a year, who's a sophomore at the time, went to his his company, Spider D, uh, shaved my head, did all the things and was was kind of going pretty good. I enjoyed it. Uh, but the biggest thing was I needed to pay for my truck. So, you know, I didn't have parents to get like, hey, can you cover my my truck payment while I'm in the core? Because like the course, you're a life. Mm-hmm. You know, you you do the core, you do school, you do the core. It's a full time, especially as a freshman. So, so we don't pay for foster kids once if they make it into college. We don't. Well, help, it's right? covered. The, like my foster, um, my college was covered, and I got a bunch of scholarships. It's just like anything else that yeah, I had to all take that care other of. Stuff. Yeah, right yeah, that. like food and stuff it's like food. that. You know, yeah. extra stuff extra like stuff. water and food. Yeah, yeah, meal plans and stuff like that. Stuff that usually 
Because all a Texas boy needs is his truck. Yeah. Food and water. Yeah. Whatever. That's optional. I, I can get that out of the creek or the water hose. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, so I did uh, Spider D, uh, Corps Cadets, and that lasted for about four to six weeks. Uh, and I was like, hey, I, I need a, is there any way I can get like some type of work? Like, I don't want to lose my truck. It's the only possession I got. Like, what well, if I lose that? I have nothing. You know, college is great and all, but um, they were like, hey, you'll be, especially as a freshman, it, it's a full-time job. There's no real way to work you in to anywhere. And I was like, well, I'm going to have to quit then. And then, you know, I got this speech from this upperclassman. If you quit this, you're going to quit everything for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. I was like, all right, probably not, but uh, I need my truck. That's <laughs> motivating as hell. Thank you. But uh, it was like that day um, the Twin Towers fell. I was going to ask you, man, is this around September 11th yep. when all this was going right down? down? September yeah. 11th. So you was uh, heading out the door anyways. Yep. I was headed out uh, from the Corps Cadets um, and kind of had that speech and whatnot. Got back from a class, sitting in, kind of packing up the dorm room of the of the deal. And, and one of the upperclassmen brought us in there and was like, you know, Watching on this tiny little, you know, box TV. Yeah. Uh, the second tower fall. Uh, so this was actually happening during 9-11. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So at, at first I was like, ah, I need to, you know, thought about staying in and, and kind of completing that. But, you know, that the whole adage of I was running out of cash for something I needed to some type of job. Um, I quit the court, went into back to another dorms, normal dorms, and uh, started working at the dining hall and, uh, working on campus at the bus station. Uh, but during that time, that kind of that whole image of 9-11 and, you know, the invasion of Iraq and stuff, that was all over the TV. And stuff like that just kind of ate at me, especially being a, you know, young, able-bodied male Texan. Um, I, I kept thinking to myself, I was like, you know, I need to do something now if I'm going to do it because I'm physically capable now. I can always come back to college. You know, I didn't think about all the brain injuries that I would sustain in the teams, but... I was like, I can join the military and I can come back. I can, I can finish college as an old man. There's old people running around college all the time. I can just come back and do college later. So uh, that's what I did. I started looking into the different uh, branches. Of course, my uh, my first inkling was the Marines because they're the toughest. Uh, of you the know anything about before. SEALs? No. Didn't even know what a SEAL was. Um, I didn't want to be on a ship. I knew that. Uh, Army was the second one. Uh, my foster dad was actually a, a command. So you, you were going to go Marine Corps first, huh? Well, they had that cool commercial with the dragon. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, they do. Oh they had, yes, I do. With the, the sword. Yeah, that was the uniform. Who, whoever they get the the square jawed some bitches. Yeah. In the when the uniform, I mean, they do. They they they, sell they it, must they, have, sell it well. they must have screened for that one individual guy out of thousands Look, of people. Everywhere. He was sharp. Like he was. <laughs> Every was part like, of it, his dimple looked sharp. Yeah. Man, I, I remember that dude. Yeah. Clip. Hell yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Some of those commercials, they work. Yeah. Those do work. That, that was the one I saw. <clears throat> and I was like, man, I want to be tough like that. I want to be a Marine. And then um, I went to the library. It was before the Google area. So I went to the library and researched like boot camps and stuff like that. And, you know, the Marines had the 16 week boot camp. And I was like, man, I want to be tough. Like I want to do something that's hard. Um, yeah, because so, you're tough coming out of Marine Corps boot camp. Oh, yeah. Boot yeah no matter who you are, if you go to the Marine Corps it, it, boot Marines camp, are different. I mean, they are. I'm, we, we can be completely honest now, yeah. right? There's no beating on our chest around right everybody. Some bitches are, they, when they come out of there. Any other branches, boot camps, yeah. fresh boot camp guys? If they tell you that, they're full of shit. Yeah. If the if Marine <laughs> is straight up, yeah. that's, that's, a tr that's a fact. They, they, they change can't your life freaking Can't take years. that away from them no matter how we want, bad we want to. Even if they complete Marine boot camp and get out, they are changed for life. Yeah. But, Whoever came up with that? With them dudes? Yeah. And that, and that, that whole in crucible? In a bar, you know? In, it's probably in a any, bar, right? Any, any department Bunch designed of in, a, in a bar in that, you know. You know it's going to be good. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's going to be good. It's going to be a great That's a good point. unit. Okay, so you're in the library looking at boot camp. Yep. Yeah, uh, just looking up different branches, doing the researches. Uh, obviously, it's all the commercials. So I was looking at the Marine stuff, but I was interested in some of the other stuff and then i came across you know special forces army rangers and i was like oh these guys are cool um you know did as much research as i could on those guys and it kind of opened up the pathway to different special operations special forces and then the seals came up and i was like oh what are these was guys? the book you found uh yeah it was actually hell week was the name of the book you know not knowing anything about my family history that will get into that here in a little bit but i find the, the navy seals and what attracted me to the teams was the diving uh, I read that book and it, it was intimidating just reading it about just the process of Hell Week and budge training. And I was like, holy crap, this sounds impossible. I want to do it. But what attracted me to the whole whole community was that the combat diving. And uh, I love water. Growing up, it can keep me out of body of water. Lake, pond, tank, 
trough. Like I was always trying to find some way to get wet just regardless because I loved water. I wasn't, didn't compete in any swimming sports, um, but I was a decently good swimmer and I just loved being in the water. So I was like, you know what? I want to do I want to do the Navy SEAL route. So, of course, I did what any college kid would. I went and bought U.S. Navy SOCOM 2 on PlayStation 2, started playing that for 10 years in Navy SEAL. <laughs> the coverage is excellent. I know. And you can learn so much from that thing. There's a video game? Yeah. Oh, yeah, a bunch of them. Yeah, there's tons of them now tons of back them. then. Because they had that commercial, but the team guys stand overseas and they're playing uh, online. That is probably one of the most quoted things. And the best commercial. Yeah. That rec That's a recruiting tool all in itself. Oh, yeah. Oh. We need to pull these. All I'll these never forget up. when I saw. I mean, when I whoever got, whoever came up with that one. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. So I got the game, and then I saw the commercial. Based a bunch of college kids online playing. Uh, it's a shooter game. It's kind of like a Call of Duty games now, but this mm -hmm. was like pre Call of Duty. This was U.S. SOCOM Navy SEALs. Too. <laughs> I love it. Um. So all these kids are playing. You know, talking on their headsets. Like crap, they're all he's on top of me. Crap, I can't avoid him. Man, who are these guys? And it's a bunch of team guys overseas. Oh and my it's gosh. like they high five each other. It's like shooting fish, fish in, a in a barrel. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're playing, they're playing these kids, and he just kind of leans back, and I thought, right there. Okay, quick. 10 seconds on the clock. How many things can you name that are always growing? Uh, relationships, lobsters, and the universe. Well, how about businesses on Shopify? Whether you're just starting out or you're scaling up, Shopify is your ultimate companion for building and growing your online store. You can manage inventory, process orders, and even track sales seamlessly with Shopify's user-friendly dashboard. And the best part? Shopify's intuitive program allows you to customize your storefront however you'd like, so you can create a unique and engaging experience for all of your customers. They even boast a checkout rate that's 36% better than other leading platforms. I know at T&Q, Shopify has revolutionized the way we operate our store system. It gives us freedom to focus on what truly matters, and that's you guys. Join the millions of entrepreneurs worldwide powered by Shopify, and let's grow your business together. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way because businesses that grow, they grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash TNQ, all lowercase. Visit shopify.com slash TNQ now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash TNQ. If it wasn't for Charlie Sheen got me. Yeah, I didn't even see the, the, the SEALs movie until I got into teams. And that was like, what buds? What'd you think when you saw that? I was blown away. I it is like, right. I want to be Charlie Sheen. Charlie Sheen. <laughs> Everybody asked, "Who are you?" I'm like freaking Charlie Sheen in the teams, man. That's who I tried to but, uh, <laughs> nope. emulate. So that was the the, the beginning stages. Um, then I went and talked to a Navy recruiter. Went straight to the Navy recruiter. Say, "Hey, I want to go to Buds." What do you say? Because this is after nine eleven. Yep, this is after nine eleven. So looked, there's a flood coming in. Uh, not for the teams. It was not not land passes. Uh, mostly, mostly no, he's believe at it or not, station. that's right. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's College right. Station. Mostly, the guys wanting to go in the teams were going Marines and Army, like because that was the invasion. Like that's all you uh, saw. Oh yeah, Marines yeah, yeah, and yeah, Army yeah, yeah. on yeah, TV. Right. You didn't see anything about team guys. Right. So I went there, talked to him, and he kind of looked at me because I was still scrawny and out of shape. I was probably like I said, like one fifty in college, eighteen, nineteen at the time. Um, and he's like, y you know, a lot of guys that try out for that program quit. And I was like, yeah, I read about that. And he's like, you got a lot of ways to go. So I started that day. I went out and bought this uh, U.S. Navy SEAL fitness book, uh, Mark Day Leslie or something like that, I think his name was. Um, Chief type? Yeah. Oh, yeah. On the cover, it's him without a shirt on doing the O course. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they had a basically a workout program, just push-ups, push pull-ups, uh, runs, and swims, like the pyramid stuff and all that stuff. And that's, that's what I did, try to do my first – timed run i didn't make it a mile i was sitting there walking half time so it probably took me 15 minutes see I, that's happening to me too i just thought i could run yeah i was like oh i'm, I'm I was like, PC, who, who, who couldn't run couldn't you know? run. who so couldn't run i took off five minutes into it i'm like tasting like that copper taste in my lungs just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i wasn't designed i wasn't designed i'm not a runner yeah i'm like what the hell this is this is tough and then i got to uh there's like next to the the core dorms um there's the pull up and dip bars that used to be at a and m 
And I jumped up on that bar thinking I was going to rack out like five pull-ups and never done a pull-up in my life. And I, I couldn't pull myself up. I basically hung there for like 15 seconds. My grip gave way. And I was like, man, this is, this is going to be tough. Um, yeah, I got like probably 20 sit-ups and like 15 push-ups. Mm. I looked at that book that I had. And I was like, man, I'm not even at the day one mark right now. Um, but, you know, I got those swim times because I was always a decent swimmer anyways. Went to the pool there and, and did the, the laps. And that's what I did day in, day out. Um, got a big old tub of muscle milk. Uh, protein because I need to put on some muscle and mass. It's like, man, I'm that was like literally bean pole status. I, would, I could just send you. You were a hard gainer. Yeah, I was a hard gainer too. I I, I drink those four times a day. Yeah, that's and then what in I the did. middle of the night, four I would get up and and have another one. I and then that. I thought, I mean, I was a good swimmer, and I thought you see, think seal swimming. Yeah, it's but you got to run to the water, <laughs> and you know you got to run out of the water and all this other. But it's a lot of running. So when y'all are trying to gain weight like that when you're young, are you just eating a ton of like, peanut butter, peanut butter and anything, 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 protein, yeah, anything? Yeah. People are like, oh, I want to lose weight. I'm like, I don't even fucking talk to you, man. <laughs> My metabolism was so high, I, I didn't gain any size until I went till post butt. That stuff burned before it even got to my stomach. Oh, yeah, it was, I, I was, it was running. Just... I ran that hot, and then I remember the first time I never told you about this. First time I had to do pull ups was during the screening test. I thought because I just thought I could do them. I was like, I could pull myself up. Let me tell you something. It was a struggle. Yeah. And then my, my recruiter was a SEAL. So he, he didn't play around at all. Great dude. Bo Walsh is his name. I still keep in touch with him. 175 was his class. Oh, wow. Yep. Great dude. All right. So what about you're on day one? Yeah, day one of, of, of going to be a SEAL. Like, but you're not even in the military. No, this is, I'm still this at college. This is day one of looking at the um, book and yeah, seeing if you can books, do the... Yeah, looking at the books. Had the initial conversations. Uh, the big thing with at that time was if you wanted to do a specialty program in your contract, you had to work out with a recruiter. Yeah. Uh, my recruiter was a basic Navy guy. Cool guy. Had the sweet Navy mustache, like nobody's business. Right. Used car hair. salesman look from yeah. head to toe. That's what yeah. you want. He was, he was, you know, always outside smoking a pack of cigarettes. He was like your typical Navy chief. He was a whole tech. Um, great guy. I like talking to him. The other guy that was with him was a little younger, and he was, he was one of the recruiters that – just was there to pick up college girls, which is fine. <laughs> fine, yeah, yeah that, that was yeah. that was his his journey in life, and that was where he was at. But the the other guy was a chief. he literally pulled recruiting duty his whole life, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. But uh, I mean, he looked at me and was you know warned me of the difference. I was like, I, I want to do this, and he's like, All right, well, you got to come with this. Since if I'm writing your contract, you got to come, you know, work out with me twice a week. So I basically just did the screener test twice a week, um, which is good. Yeah, it was it was really good. That that test because <clears throat> running people can do that, swimming people can do that, the push ups. But you put that all together, yeah, is when it really get. Even when you get into buds, it still gets you. Oh yeah. If you don't do that that te- that particular test, that one, if you can get that one down to where it's not a problem for you, you're in shape. Yeah. So how long do you have to do that for? Twice a week for how long? So I initially, when I went talk to recruiter uh, at the time, they're like, hey, you have to get a specialty rate or just a rate in general. Mm-hmm. So that if you quit, the Navy can use you. Um, and I was like, all right, well, I want to be a corpsman because I was in the medical field. And it's like, ah, it's like a two-year wait right now. Like everybody wants to be a corpsman because everybody wants to be attached to the Marines, FMF. Uh, corpsman is like a highly sought out, especially around colleges because it's a smart rate, I guess. Um, and I was like, well, I don't want to wait two years. I want to get in as quick as I can. Um, what's the shortest day school you got? And they're like, uh, you can do a master at arms. It's six weeks in San Antonio. It's the military. Oh, in Texas too, yeah. Yeah, and uh, it's military police program for the Navy. And I was like... Sign me up. I can mess with guns and, and learn how carry to carry a badge and beat people yeah. up. I mean, what a great idea. <laughs> um, pretty much. But it was either that or, or GM. Uh, but I didn't think GMs would learn actually how to use firearms. They just knew how to maintenance them from what I read. So I was like, oh, I'll just do the MA thing. Because being a foster kid, I didn't I didn't grow up around firearms. Like I didn't, I wasn't allowed to mess with them or touch them or whatnot. Me and my brother had a BB gun one time. We ended up buying from Walmart and smuggled into one of the foster homes we should shoot each other with. Uh, we got way That's probably why they didn't give you all guns. Your- well, as foster kids in general, they're like, we're not allowed to touch guns. So the first <laughs> time I experienced a firearm in my hand was Navy boot camp. And it was the, you know, you got to shoot two rounds of the shotgun and you shoot this pistol, the, the Beretta for yeah. I don't know, like five rounds maybe. Um, so I was like, oh crap, I suck at shooting. But yeah, went to master at arms school. They actually had like a, a, a week of firearms training. So you did a little I bit I didn't know you were a cop. For six weeks? <laughs> yeah, for six weeks. Yeah, but still, man, I, I didn't know you. Okay, go ahead. Yep. 
Uh, so I told him to sign me up for that so it'd be quicker um, and got into the delayed entry program and basically trained pretty much every day. Like I was always running, swimming, doing doing the screener test, like pull-ups, push-ups, set This is here, here in College Station, right? Yeah, College yeah, Station. Sure. Um, yeah, and then October 2003 was my boot camp date. So boarded a plane to Chicago. And it's the coldest I've ever been. In 2003? 2003. I can't wow. figure out what the guy, because my brother went in on November 22nd. I'm like, why do y'all go in right before the holidays? I don't know. Do they, I think the recruiters stick you. It's like a bonus for them if they can actually weasel you in on a holiday. I mean, miss Thanksgiving. my brother literally the 22nd of November. I'm like, when you show up, there's not going to be anybody there. He's like, no, it's going to be great. I'm like, I, I already been through this. Yeah. And he, he show, sure enough, he shows up. I, and I, what is it, four, three days after you get to call somebody or whatever it yeah. is? He's like, hey, there's nobody here. I'm like, I. I freaking told you. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It's like, no. team guys, you want to get in there. I remember I just wanted to go. Yeah. I I was I was ready for Buds, though. Like, I ended up crushing the, the boot camp PT test. Um, I actually ran so fast that I, I lapped some of the people that were deal and motivated, like, five or six people to actually pass it, the actual Navy run. So it's like a mile and a half, I think, at boot camp. But I ran that so fast that I was actually able to help people pass it after, like, my eighth or ninth lap. Did you get somebody to teach you how to run? No, I had to do it all by myself. You just figured it out on your own? Was there anyone there. else at A&M training to do the same there thing? There was. One one guy, um, uh, Mr. Clayton Smith, he actually uh, was on the West Coast. His team he, guy? Yeah. Um, I still talk to him. There's a day. few Aggies. There's a bunch of Aggies now, yeah. actually. Mm -hmm. uh, it was weird because we were training together. Um, I went straight in, uh, and he kind of went in and, and didn't go to Bud's, but then he ended up going to Bud's later. Uh, great guy. He went to command and stuff with me as well. Uh, but it was me and him. Like, we trained together. We actually went. There's a program at the Corps of Cadets. That now guys, there is. But there was then, too. Oh, okay. Um, where guys are going to BUDS. And since I used to be in the Corps, but it was still considered a student, we asked, like, hey, can we do this little program uh, to work up in fitness? And he's like, yeah, but you have to make it through hell night. Yeah. So, basically, you crawl through the... the they can make that suck at a college. You think that yeah. they can, but they can uh, make it suck. Oh, yeah. And upperclassmen were, were beating Especially us. Especially college kids. They can make it suck. And we had bear crawls. I'm sitting there. All these kids are you know shaved heads, and I got hair like I got right now because it was like way post um, my time in the Corps Cadets. Um, bear crawls to the, the golf course, running around on the sand, like wet and sandy the whole process. Yeah, yeah, the whole I, was, I was digging. I thought it was the greatest thing ever. It's like, oh, this is this is hardcore. I like this. You know, all the core cadets that probably had like uh, 30 or 40 guys and only 10 guys made it through the whole night. It yeah. was just one night. Um, after that night, me and Clayton made it through that night. Uh, but a bunch of the guys that were in the core didn't. And so we got talked to and like, hey, since you're not in the core and we don't want to make other kids feel bad that are in the core that didn't make it, you guys can't train with us anymore. <gasps> so we're like, oh, screw you. We'll just train our own. So me and Clayton... We crushed training by ourselves. Oh my gosh. So during this whole time, because you didn't go in until 2003, did you continue school? I did. I did. Um, did uh, classes, drove buses as much as can, and then just trained to go to Bud's because once I got my my entry date. Um, Which is what? October yeah. 2003. They told me that. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. To Bud's, I thought. Yeah. Oh, to Bud's? No, Bud's. That, that was just in the Navy. Like I, my pipeline was, I got it written in my contract because I was always told like, hey, get, get that get in your contract. Anybody out there going in the military, get it in writing. Because I... I got like a, a 97 or 98 on my ASVAP. And so they were like, we want you to go nuclear. Nuclear of course. subs. You know what you should do? You're we'll too you, should be, you should be on a submarine and they got great food. They do. <laughs> they, they have great food. And when they are on land, they're birthing top notch. Yeah. But if you're smart enough to get sold into the new, my recruiter told me, he goes, hey, don't be real smart. Have some half dumbass in you. So yeah. they put you into those nuclear reactors. <laughs> don't be too smart. Unless, or, you know, until you're a team guy. Then you have to crawl they, under them. They offered me. Like at the time, it was like fifteen thousand dollars to go nuclear. Um, Seems like a lot of money back then. It yeah. was because uh, this, this is before any other bonuses for anything else. They're like, we can't give you anything. Go to buds or master arms. We can give you three thousand because you have college credit. But if you want some cash, they were all. I was like, uh, I want to go to buds. I don't want to be stuck on a submarine. Yeah. I go to buds. <laughs> and um, we went, became a seal and got stuck on a submarine. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, it was, it was great. And, and eighteen delta, right? <laughs> no, I didn't go eighteen delta. Okay, so. Then let's keep going. From boot camp, you get yep. your orders to buds. Boot camp, uh, actually, I was listening to one of the other podcasts you were talking about. Like in boot camp, I actually got out of shape. Yeah, because I was so prepared for buds that when we go to boot camp, we were, we were part of the integrated division. So I had you know females and males in our little division um, in this new building. So they were across the hall from us, so we weren't interacted. But every time we got beat, we kind of came together, and we couldn't do no more than twenty push-ups. There was four of us that were going to buds 
in the in that class. And we'd always say something stupid so we can get more push ups or something. And then yeah, we, that's we, what we started doing too. You, <laughs> you'd you'd say something time. dumb to get in trouble so you can do push ups to get in shape. But this yeah. is in regular Chicago. This is in regular boot camp in Chicago. Right in Chicago. Um, we actually, like the second or third week, the the lead RDC uh, kind of caught wind of it. And his name was Chief Petty. And he pulled us aside. Are you kidding me? That's his name? Chief Petty. His name was Chief Petty. <laughs> he was salty. Destined for the Navy. Oh, yeah. That was, that was his goal in life. He's a great dude. But he pulled us aside and he goes, hey, I know you guys, what you guys are trying to do. Um, you guys need to stop it. You're you're defeating everybody else because everybody else was just there's people wanting to quit quit boot camp because um, getting your ass kicked so much. Yeah, yeah. like I can't do this many push ups and and like I I did like my boot camp screener I did 120 push ups, 115 sit ups, crushed the swim, um, and crushed the run. Uh, but they didn't have pull ups and stuff for uh, the regular Navy boot camp. But like the screener, I was I was all super prepared for buds. I was like, man, I'm gonna I'm gonna do great at the screen test. Um, but yeah, that eight weeks at Chicago, um, especially our division, because we had in the uh, winter time too. It was winter time, so we didn't walk very much. Um, the, the blizzards come in, you get locked indoors. Yeah, I mean, you get out. Our just, cafeteria just, was downstairs, so we didn't walk anywhere. Like, I didn't have to march too much anywhere. We had to all do the regular Navy stuff, and I was just like bored. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, that's a, that's one thing about it. But uh, uh, I remember everybody getting their orders, you know, officially, but I already had mine in my deal. I knew I was going to master at arm school and buds, you know, some of the kids were like, Oh, I'm going to Japan. I was like, man, that sounds kind of cool. I kind of want to go to Japan. I was like, nah. I remember that too, when they came walking in with their orders and, and I was like, <laughs> Hey, what, what do you, and, cause the first time you ever was read orders. Yeah. And they were like, I'm going to this and I'm going to that. I didn't even know what it was. Yeah. And we just graduated boot camp. I was like, I don't know where that's at. I don't know yeah. anything about geography, but uh, when you, <laughs> when you get your orders in and it said that first page, and it was like BUMED, Bu and it says orders to Naval Special Warfare for SEAL. I remember seeing that and it changed my life. I was like, I, I it felt like a, a certificate. Yeah. I felt, of, felt real. I, real, I, yeah. I first got that. Um, and, and, and um, when do you get that? How far into boot camp? It's the end. Yeah, towards the end after you get your Navy ball cap. Mm. You go through. <laughs> you get a ball cap? You get a sure do. You go from recruit. From to recruit. Navy. And then it says recruit in real big gold letters. I mean, you just look like a. A recruit with big gold letters on your head, and then, <laughs> then it goes to a navy ball yeah, cap. They, they That's how you identify. A, it's a whole whole night evolution process. Uh, to earn yeah, it. Uh, it's like when we get our brown shirts in Hell Week. Like you go in with a white shirt, and after yeah. Hell Week, you get a brown one. But it was only a night. Um, I was at first looking back, I felt bad, but in the, in the moment, I was trying not to laugh because some of the people is the hardest things ever done in their life. So some of them are like balling, very proud of themselves, and I was like, this, this whole night was stupid. <laughs> And so I'm trying not to laugh. I'm trying to be respectful. But looking back, I'm like, man, these people were so proud of themselves. Yes. And I, sh I should have been at the time, but I was, I literally that, turned 21 at boot camp. And mm. so that happened to me too. But you got to look at like how great it is for them to get through that. Yeah. You can't capture that at a young age, yeah. I feel. But with no. that, when you, when you see somebody going through something and it's like, wow, you know, it's a life changing moment. Yeah. What's your birthday like in boot camp? Uh, I did push ups. Which was, <laughs> I did push ups. They're like, hey, recruit, recruit Han is, is 21 today. Everybody watch him do push ups. Man, I did push ups. Did they give you a beer or anything? No, I didn't do nothing. No, I got extra ice cream. Yeah, yeah, of course. But uh, the milk at the at boot camp is real cold. Yeah. I remember that being real good. But I would eat, I got used to eating in Fox. Did they give you two times? Did you get to eat double in boot camp because you're a skinny bastard? No. No, they give me, they, they give me extra dessert all the time. I always get extra dessert. I was always hungry in boot camp. I was starving in boot camp constantly. Um, but they were giving me dessert. So, uh, no, I, I would always eat like 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 I was on a ship, I guess, because my, my chief petty was, was like, you been on a ship before? And I was like, no, I grew up in foster care. And everybody would steal my food. So I'd always eat guarded and I'd eat it so fast. Yeah. And they're like, like you're, you're built government. for the Navy. And he's like, you know, basically eating like I was a prisoner because I'd eat it so fast because I was just so hungry. And it's like, oh. And they would give me extra dessert because, like, you need to bulk up. You're too skinny. <laughs> uh, but I graduated boot camp. I gained a few pounds. I got 170. That's what I came into Buds at, 175. Yep, that's exactly what. 170. Got to checked into Buds at 175. But spent six weeks. Uh, same thing. Like, during – so Thanksgiving, we, we did uh, some kind of boot camp class demonstration for the VFW. Uh, went home uh, on uh, leave for a hot second did the six weeks and then we had christmas leave and then i checked in the buds in in january of 2005. when you left did you go to um wayne and kathy's or did you go to is that their name yeah or did you go to college station uh when i left i went to wayne kathy's yeah like once i left college station i was kind of you were in done my mirror i mean i had yeah. friends there and stuff but 
uh, no one really connected to me. So were they so proud of you? Oh, they were. That had like to be said, like. Wayne was a, a command sergeant major during the eighties and nineties. So no, he actually, right on. You left that out. Yeah, he yeah. Uh, he ran a artillery unit, so he was supposed to go to Desert Storm. He prepared his his unit, but as you know, that that lasted for a very short amount of time, and so they got him all signed up and ready to go, and then they stood him down. And um, now he was he was super stoked when I told him I was going to join the military. He never tried to push it on us or anything, but you know, I respected the regiment and the. The household that he ran uh, when I moved in as a 17, 18 year old kid. Um, and he was just great. So when he heard that I was going to join the Navy, he was booming with pride. And, and I told him about, you know, I was going to the teams and he was just even more booming with pride. It Some of those storms and shields are hard on themselves, man, but they were so badass that their war only lasted 47 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just kicked the shit out of everybody. Oh, yeah. They, they, <laughs> Guys, they were whole battalions coming in, quitting. That, yeah. They overlooked it. They think, like, hey, we didn't get the chance. Like, but dude, they're so terrified of you, yeah. man. It was over like that. Yeah. So you get to Buds. So get to Buds, January 2005. Check in. Start uh, the pre and dock phase. You know, we're just kind of, they're teaching you how to mess with the logs, mess with the boats, and all the great stuff, how to be a good bud student. So it's not a stress. What work. class are you? Uh, at the time, it was 251. I don't remember anything after my class. It got <laughs> easy after that, but go ahead. Yeah, it was pretty easy. You know, they were giving us tea at the surface. I thought class. you guys got it online, but. <laughs> that, that, that was, that was before, pre, pre-Google. So I Whatever. No. <clears throat> all right, so you show up. Show up. Um, you, you know, did, did that, was that like, I remember my first day. I do too. I okay, that's what I'm getting. I was like, man, let me feel in my blues. I what is that? My, what'd that feel like, dude? I was scared. I was like, man, I, me too. I, I didn't want to mess anything up. Like, I checked my uniform. I had my little national defense ribbon all centered up because during that time you finished boot camp, you were a boot camp survivor, you got that ribbon. Oh. Yeah, I'm right. So I was, you know, I got have you seen that t shirt where it has the national defense ribbon that says, I am somebody? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of those. I actually made a tank top that says boot camp survivor and it has that national. <laughs> it's a good one, man. Because it's like you, you automatically got it by making it through boot camp. Because it was time of war, um, yeah. I was nervous. I actually went a, went checked in with a guy I met at Master Arms School that was going through buds at the time. A guy named Daniel Conklin. Um, we checked in two five one and started the process. Uh, Is that a weekend or weekday? We checked in Monday. Did you get some special attention? Or was there things going on? Uh, we got some special attention. Yeah, of course. Got messed around with. Who's the first instructor got a hold of you? Lyman. Lyman? Will Lyman. Yep. Oh, I know who it is. Yeah. We, we do. We were at Team 5. Absolutely. Yeah. Surfboard hanging out yeah, the back yeah. of the convertible. His, his personality just, you could never tell if he was serious Serious or, not, or if he was pissed off at you. Surfer. Surfer guy. First, Freaking. First contact, <laughs> you knew he, he would make you feel like your whole life is fucked up. Oh, life. that guy could razz some. Dude, yeah, he, he had was, a gift. Yeah. Great gift. But he was the he had a first great instructor gift that I ran into. We got beat, and then we got showed uh, where our, our barracks were at the time. Were you at 618, or did you go all the way down to no, the... No, I went all the way down. Yeah, check. Whatever number that is. 604? 604, yeah, 604. Yeah, I was something like 604. that. 604. Like, it was right before they remodeled it, so it was still, like, super run down. Um, it's unbelievable now. Oh, yeah. it's it's. I remember, because right when we got done with Buds, they just finished remodeling it. So, third phase actually went back down there when it was brand new. But they, they completely gutted the, that whole side of the yeah. auto now. It's completely different now. That's something good for them. I'm glad. No, it was good. It's it was definitely grown. The stuff was kind of. So, kinda any wonky. special moments in Buds? So, first phase, yeah, when you check in, man, because I tell people, like, hey, look, reading those books is one thing. Yeah. And then watching the documentaries. But when you step in there, that's a different something altogether. Yeah. Now, the first week or so, the, the in doc phase. How'd you do? Was I was stressed out, but it. it they weren't super hard on you. Um, I mean, they were hard on you, but it wasn't. See, I told as bad. you. Did you hear what he just said? Well, in I never heard anything to, like that. They're man. just trying to show you what, what Buds <laughs> is going to be like. So, um, I mean, they'd still yell at you and you'd still mess up, but you didn't feel like you weren't going to make it kind of right. deal at the time. Um, so, you're like, hey, this is how you do log PT. Don't fuck it up. You know, this is how you do boats. Don't fuck it up. You know, this is how you do surf pass. How many did you Don't start with? Was there a bu- was winter uh, time, so probably not very many. Yeah, it was. I want to say it's about 180 uh, yeah, guys. It wasn't the full class. Um, we actually had a guy walking around in our class at the time. That he kept telling everybody, he's like, you're on the make it list? No, you're not going to make it. And he just would we'll go around <laughs> saying that. He ended up quitting day one of, of Hell Week, I remember when he quit. There's a student? He was a student? A student. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. This guy was just cocky you? as all hell. Um, <laughs> that's probably something to get the fear out of him. Yeah, he was. That sounds it, like that's what that is. Mechanism. Coping mechanism. Coping mechanism. Thank you. Super scared. 
Oh my um, gosh. But he would walk around. He just like would judge you. And I was like, what? This guy's we weird. had that in the beginning too. There's a couple of guys walking around our dicks. I'm like, in this environment, what we're yeah. going through right now, you're going to be like yeah. that? You're going to act like you're better than anybody? <laughs> I hate the last too long. I mean, and they didn't. No, they didn't. Not at all. Buds captures that. Yeah. Like if you walk in there with that attitude, that's what does well. In our environment, it captures that quick. Oh, yeah. But, uh, yep. It, so, went through that indoc phase once we got the numbers and we classed up. I remember the first day of, of phase one, bright and early, just getting beat to hell. Day one's the worst. Oh, it's, it's horrible. But they're, we, they're trying to get everyone out of there in one fell swoop. Yeah. And it, what is even, we didn't even, we didn't even do the run yet. Like, it's 3 30 in the morning. We haven't done the four mile run yet. We're getting beat because. We had two students park in instructor's spots. Oh my gosh, what idiots. Yeah, first we all got beat for that, and then they got beat even more, and then we all got beat again. Then we did the four-mile time run, which everybody failed. Obviously, it's the first day. You're going to fail that time run. Um, on the beach, 4 a.m. 4 a.m., you're not allowed to run the hard pack, the super high, soft pack. High you're, tide. Right, it's running on the water, four-mile time run. Yeah. Failing. Forget. Boots, soft sand, you're going to fail. Yeah, that was day one. I was like, holy crap, and that day lasted forever. You don't get done until... Seven eight o'clock at night. Seven o'clock. months later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Because uh, seven months asking, later, someone's talking about it's like, hey, did we have weekends off at Buds? I was like, we did, but we didn't because you had we still had to paint our own helmets. Mm-hmm. We're sharpening our own knives. Had to clean the floor. You had to completely pull everything out of your room and yeah. buff the floors and everything. Yeah, we on did, weekend? but we didn't. Now, yeah, on weekends. On weekends. I could, Buds Sundays. I come like being at Shawshank. It's it's a state of depression. Yeah. A Bud Sunday for any Bud student, you you ask him about that, man, because they got a phone that they can call Mother Nature. It's a direct line to her, so they pick it up in the first phase office and these clouds roll in <laughs> Sunday night and, and this gloom kind of overcast shadows. Not the and, direct line to the Phantom. And, and she's different. Yeah. And then, um, <laughs> oh, dude, Bud Sundays, you know what I was thinking about the other day? It was a freaking dive socks. Yeah. Those nice wool dive socks. That that and there's there's things inside Buzz that no one ever talks about that that will break a man. I've seen guys quit over those di- trying to put a pair of dive socks on. They've been washed four or five yeah, times because they just they become so stiff and they lose their flexibility. You, it's like this wool. It's a yeah. people don't have any idea what we're talking about. You can't. Anybody's had to deal with that. It's stuff like that, man. First face. God, yeah, they, dude. Who's your proctor? Uh, so. Bill Lyman was my proctor in Indoc. Andy was your proctor? No. Oh, okay. So first phase, we had Welvert. Did you ever have any time we were going to quit? No. Did it ever thought creep up in your mind? No, I was. Did it ever so, creep up in your mind how bad this sucks? It did, but it was it was a comforting feeling. Where was that at? Like first week, the first. Phase. When was your hell week? Uh, so the first one uh, was in August. Nope, sorry. First one was in March with 251, and then I got rolled into 252. Yeah. I got hurt during Hell Week, and I started over. How'd you get hurt? Um, so the, the log came on my shoulder funny, and it did something with a nerve, and my whole arm went numb. Mm. Um, it was scary, because I was like, what the hell? Because I couldn't move my arm, couldn't feel it, and it was just kind of hanging there. And so I was grabbing my other hand, I'm holding the log, and one of the guys that was in my boat crew, he has like three brothers in teams, Chooch, Chuchro, mm-hmm. Jack, and he's like, you know, put out, you know, you start bragging on guys that aren't giving their all effort. And the instructor calls me over, tells me to bear crawl, and I can't bear crawl one arm. It's like Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, hell week. It's like right before we secured the logs. Um, they go me check to go check out a medical, and the, the doctor's like, yeah, you got something going on with your nerve. Like, it may be nerve damage. It could be two weeks. It could be two months. It could be the rest of your life. Oh, my gosh. And I was just sitting there going, what? <laughs> like, we'll just evaluate you, and you got, we have to... Basically, put you on med hold for right now and, and see if it gets any better. If not, we got to kick. Is this in Hell Week? Or is yeah. this long? Yeah. Hell Week, Nick like 251. Like, I made it through the first three and a half weeks of first phase. So, it's fourth week for y'all? Yeah. Check. And you made it all the way to Wednesday? Yeah. Or, yeah, Wednesday? Yeah. Okay, let's talk workout essentials. Sure, headphones pretty much always top my list. But you know what truly takes your routine to the next level? It's called FitBod. I rely on this app every time I hit the gym because it takes all the guesswork out of planning my own workouts. It makes it so easy. Every morning, I wake up to a new push notification with my freshly tailored workout of the day. And with over 1,000 workouts and demonstration videos, I never get burnout or have to second guess any movements because it shows me right there in the app. So whether you're a seasoned athlete or just starting out, start tracking your workouts with FitBod because all you have to do is stay a little consistent and FitBod will do the rest. 
Add FitBot to your workout essentials. Join FitBot today to get your personalized workout plan. Get 25% off of your subscription or try the app for free at fitbot.me slash TNQ. That's F-I-T-B-O-D dot M-E slash TNQ. Then like, all right, well, we got to roll you. Uh, if you get better, we'll start you off day one and class up again. So I made it through that far with 251 and got hurt and started off day one pre and doc again. Bill Lyman saw me again, beat me again. Oh my gosh. Um, That's the worst. You had to yeah. start all over on yeah. 252. Yeah. I got a double roll. Oh, that seemed worse. It was after Hellwick. I was in second phase. I broke my leg and got double rolled back. I mean, but I got picked up in second phase, though. That was the cool part. Yeah. I was glad I started over again. It it builds definitely confidence. That, that, well, confidence because I knew exactly what was going to happen the first three weeks plus the first three days of Hell Week. But uh, just that camaraderie with the class. Like every time we picked up a guy, like later at uh, post, you know, post buds, guys get hurt during Hydro Hell Week or the stress fractures are too much after Hell Week, the guys would get rolled to the next class, give them the heal. Mm-hmm. And it just wasn't the same for They're them. They're the best ones to get. Yeah. What are you doing when you're just waiting to heal and getting rolled to the next class? Physical therapy. Yeah. Uh, Watching whatever instructors want you to do, yeah. trying to disappear. You get really st- good at being not seen. You're still working. Oh you're yeah, still doing yeah, yeah, yeah. You're this still doing things. Freaking... You're doing whatever you can. They still surf towards you. Yeah. Oh really? They would they would march us down with our all the guys on crutches all the way down to the surf zone. Lay us oh down. We would have to keep our crutches in the air while the surf rolled in. <laughs> on the, I'll never, they thought that was the best. That was because it's also good for you. Yeah, that's a medical treatment. Cold water. They're icing their wounds with a cast. It didn't matter with this. <laughs> they freaking, talking about seals, they don't give a damn. No. Um, it's constant uniform inspections. Like, I, I was glad when we classed up again because I'd actually be running around with logs on my head instead of doing uniform, uniform inspections. Uniform inspections, yeah. Because you, all the time. you never have a perfect uniform, especially pre Hell Week. It's like we'd have this place called A.B. Bryce that would starch it so it'd stand it up and it'd be completely perfect to anybody's standards. But You say that name, A.B. Bryce, standing team guy, I don't know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. There's, there's one van pulls in. I don't yeah. know if still do yeah. pull in there, but I, I don't think they do. They're required anymore. They somebody complained about it costing. I heard you didn't have to freaking paint those helmets no. and then put that varathane over the top of it anymore. No, that not. was the worst. Because you get like just slightest breeze. You're sitting there like all cornered where you don't think the wind and sand's going to get it. Because any bits of sand that gets on that helmet, it's completely ruined. You got to start over. Completely. So you got to strip it back down. And this is a day evolution. Yeah. Uh, Sundays, you're sitting there with a the helmet on a stick. There's everybody around you. You're trying to fight guys off going, hey, man, don't get your spray paint on mine. And you're, you got to put those stickers completely straight. And if you put it on too soon, you'll mess it up. And stickers on slightly crooked. You got to rip everything off, start over again. Because it won't go flat. Yeah. And then you got to pour that damn Varathane over the can't be any bubbles. And I saw one time an instructor walked up and grabbed this dude's helmet and was looking at it and saw a bubble in it. Walked to the second phase grinder, got on a motorcycle, put that helmet underneath the front tire and rode around the compound <laughs> with that son of a bitch underneath the front tire, just scratching the paint off it. Came back over and then threw it on the ground and then made that thing bounce all the way to the ceiling of the compound. Did the guy quit? Eventually. Yeah. Yeah, they made, that guy eventually went away. They didn't like him. Yeah. They don't but like I, you. That was a, oh, you're, yeah, if they don't yeah, like you, you're done. If they don't like you and, and if you're, Look, you're trying to hide out or whatnot. There's no way you can get through our program if you're if you're like that. No. Period. Oh, my gosh. That's okay. an unwritten So how did you do conduct. in phase two? And... Yeah, because you said you were a diver yeah. and you loved the water. I did too. Second oh. phase was a kick in the shorts. I love phase. I love phase two. I love well, you're a phase. freaking. Um, no, I, I during the, uh, the pool week, I had. Nah, I know he's week. lying. No. no. I, I loved it. Y'all hear this, America? I love the water, but I had I had to make it to the very last evolution in pool week because I failed the the last final you know ditch and dawn. Pool comp, yeah. Four, um, you're a, uh, on the four time, yeah. Yeah, me too. Don't worry about it. I was sitting there sweating bullets. I was like, man, I sweating it. underwater. Yeah, it was weird. I was the most scared I've ever been was during pool comp because I, I the 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 time before I actually passed, um, I failed because like they when they did the whammy knot they tore the hose, and so. I recognized the whammy knot, and so you know I did all the things. I waved off, come up, and they like you could have breathed through that tore in the hose. You should have put your man. mouth on it. Fail. Oh my gosh! And so I was like, oh man, like I because I like very particular procedures. I was like super slow because I'm comfortable in the water. Like during the first phase where everybody's blacked out, mask full of water, and everybody starts panicking, calming each other. Like I would go right below the water and just be 
cool. Like I, it's like, you know what? I'm, I'm not crazy underwater. If I'm not afraid of drowning or whatnot. Uh, so uh, like underwater when they're messed with me, like I still have my actually IG master chief IG yeah, yeah. Um, was the lead diver on the, on that uh, week. And he actually gave us a pool comp video, which was cool. But you have a uh, video of your pool comp. Yeah. Oh, nice. Um, uh, but yeah, no, I ended up passing second phase, uh, and midway through second phase, they have this thing called a uh, legacy beatdown. So if you had, uh, I don't know if it happened for every class, but our class, they basically pulled everybody that had uncles, dads, grandpas, and then teams, UDTs, and you got a special beating. Like, you think you're going to make it through this program because you got, you know, folks in. That's how much we love you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, they pulled me in, and I, I I got beat with those guys, and I'm, I'm kind of dumbfounded by it. I'm like, they're like, who do you, who do you know that's in the teams? They're like, nobody. Like, you don't know who Ronnie Hahn is? And I was like, oh, that's my uncle, uh, uncle Ronnie. I got an Uncle Ronnie. Um, come to find out, my uh, my biological uncle was in the teams during Vietnam. So oh, wow. He's still alive? No, he actually passed away. Uh, did, you, did you ever get to meet him? Or? Uh, I got to talk to him on the phone. He ended up uh, ended up hunting him down because he got in some legal trouble or something and kind of hit out. But then he ended up having a stroke. Uh, my whole family what class? got him. 41. 40. How cool. Yeah. So, and you uh, never knew that. I didn't know that until... Did you find his picture? Phase. I did. I got his class picture. Actually, okay, that's cool. I actually got his third face picture when he was at the island. Oh, wow. So uh, you are... Okay, legacy. That's cool. Yeah. So, so you was, found that out while you were in? Yeah. Because he was getting beat down for the legacy. Mm. You didn't know See, why. some beatings are worth it. <laughs> yeah. Look at that. Dude, it, it, no matter... At that point when I heard that and I kind of was like, had that conversation... They could have literally started doing anything they wanted to me. I was so proud. Oh, it's a ga- that's a like, game changer. Like, Are you kidding me? This is awesome. This explains so much, so much why yeah. I was drawn to this, you know, just because hard as, hard as nails kind of deal. Um, I ended up talking to a bunch of guys from his buds class and found out how crazy he was, and it made a whole lot of sense. <laughs> um, but no, he was at a SEAL Team 1 during Vietnam, um, found, uh, you know, his DD-214 and, and kind of his discharge stuff. That's cool. Uh, yeah, he on the Bud's registry, got his class picture, got his individual picture up at that my office so next cool. to mine. Yeah, Your dad's cool. brother? Yeah, my dad's brother. It's my mission to throw a reunion for every team guy, for every SEAL that's had a trident pin on his chest in 2028 when we all, we're all going to meet in one spot. I'm in. I'll be there no matter what. I mean, I'm, I'm getting that done. I'm putting it out right now on the air. So, okay, so you graduate. Let's move forward. Four. You graduate um, Bud's. Yep. And do you have to go into the master of arms is that your no. designation no so master of arms was the a school before buds okay it's only like six weeks okay. it's a backup if you don't make it yeah so what do you how do you get to choose your like what your specialty is going to be when you're in buds what do you mean like by don't you 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 did 18 delta that's the only one okay yeah. so you don't that's, choose that's the only other one than that. that's the only one besides that's the that, only... they're like who, who's what usually else? it's whoever's got a corpsman background or went to core school Okay. Um, but they yeah. asked for volunteers. Yes. That's a great question. I'm so, sorry, I didn't know what you were saying. It's, yeah. it's what, the only way. What team yeah. did you go to? So, Buds, I finished Buds uh-huh. in uh, February 2005. Uh, started SQT. So, you don't go straight to a team. Yeah. Sorry. So, SQT started that process. Uh, that was fairly new at the time because they did have STT at the team. So, basically, after Buds, you go to your team and you have to earn your trident through whatever trials they had there. Um, but now they kind of universalized it. Every buds class kind of stuck together and went through SQT. Um, that's the first time I heard about Marcus was during SQT, yeah, you know, June 2005. That, that, that brought everybody together, kind of put that out. What happened? Um, oh, they were wow. looking for Marcus still, and that like it lit a fire in me. Like I was like, man, I, I can't fucking wait to get over there and shoot people in the face. Oh my god! Because um, that's, that's, that's so exactly were, how we feel. You were in SQT I was during in SQT, Red Wing. Yep, and was headed towards the because a lot of the instructors had been on the teams with Marcus and everybody else and the guys mm-hmm. that went down on those helicopters. So I mean, they were fired up, yeah. which got us fired up. SQT is like, if you're no longer getting treated like a you know a nobody. Yeah, like you're like, hey, you're about because I got my trident you know in August. So we were towards the end of our SQT. We're about to go. You're no to, longer treated like a turd. Yeah, you're treated like a turd that's in a toilet. It's like yeah. been put in its right place. Yeah. And it's kinda, <laughs> oh exactly. It doesn't stink as bad. Yeah. It's the best way I can explain you're, it. Yeah, pretty like, much. You're not getting stepped in. See, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like there he is. You know. Yeah, there's 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 a turd. He, he needs to be polished yeah. a little bit better. Yeah. So August 2005, I got my trident um, and got assigned to SEAL Team Five. Is that where you wanted to go? Yeah, I wanted to go to the West Coast. Did you put that on your dream sheet? How, what was your dream sheet? Did you just, it was, was West it Coast. Just, so they, just by coast? Yeah, coast. So they would say, hey, West Coast, East Coast, and STV. And I heard you know horror stories about STV. As much as I wanted to be a diver, I didn't want to. After going through that whole training process, 
I didn't want to focus on nothing but diving. See, like, man, I had to go to special deliveries first. I'm a regulator. Yeah. And for those of you, I talk to people all the time, man. It's like, you, no one knows about us. Well, now I, I heard would, that I, it's like... It's the toughest people, team out there. Everyone thinks SEAL Team it. 6 is. SDV 1 is actually Special Delivery 6. So, <laughs> yeah, there, you like that? Because <laughs> <Nice. laughs> uh, you've heard what they've turned it into. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, it's a serious team. I was kind of envious after getting into my career as much as I did. Going, man, I'm sad I never really actually got into... Did you ever get on one? I got into an SDV. Did, it, did we, we take did, you? Did we take you for a ride? Yeah. Oh, so cool. when I was at the command, we went and. All right. we were That's right. It's a qual you guys have to do, yeah, right? We had to do some uh, inter op stuff with with the SDV team, so we went down there and rode in the SDV. So team five. So SQT, you. That's when Red Wing happens. That's like the first huge tragedy yep. in the Afghanistan war. I mean, there was, um, Anaconda was before that, but while you were in, this yeah. was the big, first really big tragedy. And that lit. Oh that yeah, that was a super. Fire. So I was in school when Anaconda went down. Yeah. I remember studying and hearing all about that and then hearing about those guys. And then I ran into them in a, Afghanistan. So we're all connected mm -hmm. just yeah. on the timeline. No, I know, I'm just doing the timeline for yeah. uh, So one of the reasons after reading all the Vietnam books and stuff, that drew me to the teams as well was the, uh, I guess the, the attrition rate for guys dying overseas. Like in Vietnam, team mm -hmm. guys were like the lowest as far as numbers percentages wise. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't go back to World War II and stuff until later, and I found out like, you know, if you're a team guy, you're probably going to die doing the, the Scouts and Raiders piece. Mm -hmm. But Vietnam, they were feared. Like all those books, I was like, man, I want to be, I want to be one of those guys. Mm -hmm. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is only good through April 30th, so get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply, and now for some legal info. Claim as of quarter one, 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of the first 3% match. You must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA is available to U.S. customers in good standing. So when I heard about this, I was like shook. And but at the same time, I was like, had a fire in my ass. Like mm -hmm. all the instructors were fired up. They were like, going to the you know phase oic going hey we want to go back to the team we want to go back to platoon i know they want guys um and it was it was one of those things like all right this is for real like we're uh we're actually going to be face to face with bad guys we're not just going to kind of talk about it pretend about it you know mm -hmm. um so yeah uh got my trident checked into team five uh and then uh, the second or third trip at shaw's is when i officially met mr marcus and mm -hmm. morgan because um, y'all got on Team 5. I'd yeah. just gotten back from the hospital, yep. or from Afghanistan, and got out of the hospital, and then they moved me to Team 5. And they asked what, what, what I, if I needed anything. I was like, I'd like to take my brother with me. Yeah. So we showed up over there, which I got to tell you. How is that, I, though? I was a brand new guy. But how was that, like, being a new guy and having Marcus show up because you had known, like, the what happened, and his brother coming like because brothers never served on a team together so what was that like for you uh that was pretty cool like i don't know it, it kind of solidified the the family dynamic the brotherhood dynamic that was one of the huge things again that brought me to the teams was like growing up as a child i didn't have any connection to anybody like mm -hmm. i rarely saw my actual brother because i moved to so many different foster homes there was no consistency as far as people in my life until the very end of my foster kid career I guess you could call it, but um, with my foster parents, but everybody else uh, to my life until then were just passengers, I guess, just mm -hmm. people I've, I've introduced myself and seen. 
but I never really bonded with anybody until I went to Buds. And like, I can, you know, tell you everybody that I went to Buds with, that completed Buds with me, everybody I went on a team with, um, like their lifelong imprint on my life because of the community. And so, you know, seeing those guys was, just, you know, another, you know, all moment and mm-hmm. uh the first things that you know we sat down at the shaw's house and he kind of briefed us on what happened and um it, it motivated me even more to like fuck man i can't wait to deploy like i want to kick yeah. people's teeth in <laughs> that was the best deployment it was the hardest one the best stack of guys yeah that, that whole troop task units we had out there from ramani habania that whole stretch was awesome yeah it's a good deployment it was a good deployment. i was a train wreck <laughs> like I just gotten out of the hospital. I was. That's, that's, yeah. They knew that. They yeah. knew that. How how could you not be after? That was the best part about it because they that, that's why they stuck me back with them. So I was broken up and everything. My freaking and then uh, piss and shit and blood all. Oh time. man, every day. <laughs> you can't. But I mean, it, it started to be a running. It's probably joke. the best thing for him though. Like it was I, the best thing I for me. Imagine being in his position and then just pulling you out of the community. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I, so whoever had the hand, the Master Chiefs and the XO, uh, Ops, DQ, all them, from all the way up to the guys, yeah. from, including the Master Chief, man, Nash Jack, to keep me in there was the best freaking thing that ever happened to me. I would have broke. Yeah. If you'd have pulled me away from that, because that was the worst part was my, I mean, my body, we, we get beat up every day. Yeah. That's that's whatever. But um, having to be around, like I never had time to think about anything else. It was kind of a, it was a perfect place to be. And then Ramani, where they sent us, hell, I definitely couldn't think about anything else. Ramani was serious. It was serious like business. We man. turned over with Team 3, T- Task Force Bruiser. Yeah, Task Force Bruiser. So you're and, talking about uh, Chris Kyle yeah. and Jocko and, yeah. and Leif Babin. Like that, that's who we relieved, those guys. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Of course, the two guys that died were the guys I went through Buds with, Mikey Monsoor and Mark Lee. Right. Mm-hmm. So like being a new guy, it was like the whole reality of the situation, like, hey, the only way to survive this situation is to be with your brothers and be ready for it, but just accept that death is, an, is a possibility. Um, uh, I'll never... F- I walked into medical to do my physical therapy, and there was a Team 3 guy in there. He had been hit by a grenade, and I'll never forget. I kind of poked my head in because they wanted me to see him. Yeah. And I looked at you could tell that he had that Ramadi stare, that yeah. whole... that whole. And they he, got in some serious gunfire. Oh, I asked him, I was like, hey, man, what do you, you got any advice? I'm taking my boys into Ramadi. What do you need me to do? He's like, pray. Yeah. And I was like, roger that. And it was a different, a completely different kind of war than Afghanistan. Oh, absolutely. No. That environment, it was the last stand for all of those guys. Yeah. I mean, we got our, I mean, it was on in yeah. Ramadi. We got some pretty good gunfights in Iraq. Sure did. Iraq. And our, our guys took heavy. So Elliot got hit there. Yep, Elliot, yeah, my first deployment. So. Your first deployment was Ramadi in 05. Well, I was in Habaniya, but we... we so we, we rotated. We, it yeah, didn't we matter. Rotated. Like we my, my task unit was in Ramadi, or Habaniya. Marcus's was in Ramadi. But we it was always exchange of guys. Like, hey, if nothing's going over here, we're going to support these guys. Mm-hmm. There was so much like, I would, target I ran into days. a sergeant major one time. We started just... We had to, at an event and he started talking and he's like you were where were you at and i started telling him he was like ramadi and i told him i was like shark base and i was this guy and i did this he goes you son of a bitch he goes you were the best wordsmith i've ever encountered in my entire life he's like you could write an op some i would reword something to say the same thing a hundred just to get the guys in the fight yeah because i i was so busted up i got the desk but i made sure them suckers got it yeah I, that was my deal you rotate them to me man i'll put you in a fight don't come over if you don't want to fight because i mean we got it on that was right after Mark Lee yep. and Mikey and all them went in. That, that's why we did that. Remember, yep, remember Elliot got blew up. And Elliot got hit and yeah. all them guys. Joe. Fuck, dude, um, that place. Yeah, that was. Those guys could scrap. Yeah. No, the, the Ramadi guys that we were fighting against were serious dudes. We could scrap. Which is good. It, it was yeah, it's good. good. No, it's it's baptizing by fire kind of deal. Um, yep, finished that deployment. Um, came back. Uh, it's funny because when I checked into Team 5, my LPO can't get the speech like hey you like same thing instructors were telling us like hey you got to be prepared to, you're gonna probably shoot somebody in the face if you're not mentally prepared for that then you're in the wrong line of work um and those guys when i checked in team five they just got back from fallujah and mm-hmm. that was when the marines pushed through so that was like the 2003 2004 mm-hmm. deployment Dude. and those guys were same that thing, fight on. yeah that was serious as well because you know the same thing that's when mm-hmm. chris kyle just got back from that as well um Somebody mentioned about uh, Damnek, and I'd never heard of, of Damnek before, a development group. Uh, but my LPO is like, those guys are doing the exact same thing we are. We're all getting in gunfights right now. Don't even worry about that right now. You're a new guy. Focus on this. I'm like, sweet. Uh, Matt Lennick was my LPO first. He lives here. Yeah. I talk to him all the time. Great guy. I like Matt. He's calmed down. Hard not. 
Calm yeah. down. Is that that's Just not really the word I would use? But yeah, I mean, I guess it's scary. From, from the fucking Team Five days to now. <laughs> well, he talks to me. We talk about the Bible now. He's got kids that are geniuses. He, he, he switch. Yeah. switches. We, we eat breakfast still there. Yeah, yeah, on Saturdays we get together, and I'm looking at him. I'm like, who, who, who are you, man? Yeah. Yeah, yeah they have uh, he's a lot of fun Saturday. to have on appointment. Yeah, you want to go in a gunfight with? Is that dude? Yeah, there's a few of them. He's one of them. So, yep. So that deployment, I actually towards the end, we went up to uh, Rawa, North Iraq, and we interrupted with uh, the Team Four guys that were over there. And that's when Clark Schweller got shot. Um, Mikey too. Yep. And so, actually, the guys that were up there were you know it was Ed a turnover Byers. up. Yeah. Ed, so Ed Byers was one of the guys I was up there with. That's right, Eddie. That's right. And some of the other guys, all those guys were screening for Damnick. So that's the first time I heard of that. And I was like, Is that when they did that big grab? Yeah. It was, right? Yeah. And so that was the first time I heard about the command. And I was like, I want to, I want to do that. Like, I want to, I want to be better. Mm -hmm. So well, as soon as I, like that, the end of that deployment, I started training and, you know, getting ready to go and put my package in for the command. Is that fun? The, the process or the command? Green team? No, it sucked even worse. It's like Buzz, buzz right? No, it was worse. It's worse. It's more. Mental. It's way worse because yeah. it's yeah. Because you're a team, you got your training already. Yeah. I've always heard. I never made it. I always only made it to five. Yeah. <laughs> he always says I only made it to five. If you're like, hey man, were you still team six? It's like, no nah, man, I only made it to five, dude. <laughs> Thanks for bringing up old wounds, though. Yeah, I got back from that deployment uh, and wanted to put my package in the screen. Uh, at the time, they required that you had to at least have two wartime deployments. Oh, they kept that. Uh, they were just. Relaxing that because the amount of gunfights were actually because I feel like something like Biss he got sucked over there and went out of buds. I felt like no, he, he went, he went, he's at five for a yeah, little bit, right? He, was, he went through the Fallujah deployment, like right yeah. when I got to five and checked in, he was going over there because they the amount of gunfights and the deployments were so because it used to be before that they're like, hey, you nothing, to be, you had yeah, to be in some type of combat, right? Right, 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 right. So if you didn't go to Bosnia and get because there wasn't much, yeah, because that was like Marcinko's deal, like, hey, we want guys. Yeah, yeah, we're from the Vietnam era to, to come to this command, not guys just going through buds and wearing black mustaches and body armor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, yeah, that started. They went down to just one t one deployment, but it had to be a wartime deployment. You couldn't go to the PI. Oh, uh, Roger that. I understand what you're saying. So, uh, yep, heard about that. And I was like, hey, I want to have this next the next platoon for me preparing to go um, and screen. And I want to deploy one more time to Iraq because it was so intense the first time. Um, and that's what I did the second second rotation. Were you still with five? Yeah. But how long after did you go back over? Did you jump right back in? So no, I, I did the whole full rotation. So oh, okay, like a year and a half. Were you married at the time? Uh, I was not at the time. Okay. I was not at the time. So I was married out of high school. When I got through buds, we got divorced, and then I got married at, right when I checked into the command with my second wife. Mm. But at the time, uh, going through at Team Five, I wasn't married. What are they at command? They say tell you guys not to do that right away. Get, get married? married. Well, I was already with a girl with who had my first son. You're talking. Ah, oh, Roger that check. And uh, that was kind of a different situation. But we got married real quick at the courthouse before I went to screen for Green Team um, to kind of officialize everything because a lot of stuff was moving fast and didn't want the way the only way they're going to move her and my son over to the east coast was obviously yeah i get it and if you die dependent yeah and if i die i didn't want to not have any because every time we make one of those advancements it gets closer yeah exactly so yep second deployment uh Fluja at team five did that whole rotation and in 2009 i went to uh, green team i tell people the funniest thing you will ever see is us filling out our wills yeah before we we went over when we were at five, I remember all of us sitting in that in that big conference room filling out our wills. I, I I didn't laugh that hard for a while. Well, we actually also my first deployment, we got the uh, the Navy Federal uh, million dollar life insurance policy because um, that was like free pretty much. And guys in my platoon were just putting each other, so <laughs> it was like one of those things. It was twisted because like, man, if one guy makes it back, he's going to be fucking loaded. Loaded. <laughs> Then you're wondering, like, hey, man, you're not going to kill me while we're over yeah, here, are you? Or, or, or not kill me, but are you going to try and save me, though? Yeah. Oh, my god. And gosh. guys would leave. It was like, how much How much you need, man? How much your truck? All right, I got you right here, man. And I just sit there, 10%. To, yeah. And oh then I want, I want a Viking funeral, yeah. and I want Ted Nugent to play the Spar Star Spangled Band. I mean, dude, guys would get... I want George W. Bush to be my casket. You know, yeah, all that. that was, I want him to be my Paul you, you couldn't even imagine what they would come up with. the funniest, because, you know, the warriors got to read this. And like, you guys, you know, it's like, hey, this is what I want. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so, so you get was, through Green Team. How yeah, was so that? Yeah, so Green Team. 
So green team, we had about 80 seasoned team guys. Like these guys weren't brand new guys at all. We'd all been through at least two deployments to Iraq. Mm -hmm. And some guys actually augmented the command and some aspects in the command was, you know, the reason why they only had such short deployments at the time is because they were nightly hitting, you know, multiple targets. So um, to screen for the deal, you had to at least two deployments and you had to be good standing with uh, your platoons and whatnot. So you couldn't be a shit bird mm -hmm. or anything else. Like if you were the guy that just went to work and, and, and left and always gone for some reason, uh, didn't have a good reputation for X, Y, and Z, like you were denied immediately. You didn't even get a chance to screen no matter how physically fit you thought you were, how good at CQB you thought you were. Yeah. That's a good part about that. Yeah. That was, that was a great part because you know, you had those guys, even though you're in the team, you're like, man, I really hope I don't have to deploy this guy. Then it goes in like we're all in the same university in the Navy, but they're the rich fraternity. Yeah, <laughs> they're the rich fraternity. I remember walking in the first time I got to, over there with Sheffield Slab. Yeah. And I walked in there and I was like, this, this, what, this is what I thought it was supposed to look like. Yeah, this is exactly <laughs> what happened because my second deployment or second rotation with five, we went over there and did like a interop stuff and Blue Squadron at the time. Was, That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. We, when they were stuck in those dunes out there. Yeah, we... Uh, Met up with uh, Dusty Markham. That's exactly who I'm and talking about. He, he had all these pictures of terrorists, dead terrorists on the table. And he goes, this is how many people we took off the battlefield uh, our last deployment. Bro, there was probably 200 to 300 pictures. Let me tell you something. Oh that setup they had was the coolest. Yeah. I don't know if y'all replicated that, if they ever did that again. But whoever was running, Slab was there and those guys. Yep. The whole location... I mean, they found me and AJ out in the desert because we were at that. We had been at that airport trying to get back to y'all because we were making our rotations yeah. around there. And he just comes walking up. I was doing a horror bath in that bathroom for like the second week in a row, and he's like, "What are you doing out here?" I was like, I'm, "I don't. Nobody come get me." <laughs> I'm like, "We're here. Walk over here." Y'all had been there the whole time, and it was <laughs> yeah. the freaking coolest. Yeah. So as soon as I saw that, matter of fact, they shit out a helicopter for us right then and there. Yeah. And that's what I couldn't get. And they're like, oh, you need a helicopter? I got mine right here. Like it was his own. <laughs> Pretty much. Like, yeah, that was great. National mission and that, yep. asset so they could get what they just needed. Sit there, just sitting there. The, helicopter, the, the pots are just sitting there in their bird laying down. Can you go somewhere? Let's go, dude. <laughs> that was a lot of fun back in those days. Yeah, for sure. No, those guys, like the, it's what drug me into it. I was like, this, so is, you, this is what I thought about being a team guy was all about. So. When you get through green team and you – go ahead, babe. I was probably going to say the same thing. When you're going through green team, do you get to choose which uh, team you're going to go to? What? No. Um, so they kind of measure kind of how you are in green team and, and personality-wise. So each of the cadre are from each of the different squadrons. Like he'll be good there. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But also it's like a, almost like an NFL draft. Like you get your picture you get because they keep track of you stats like the whole process. It's like a seven, eight-month process through green team. Um, and they're like, hey, this is this guy. He's he's you know good this this and this he's good this and this he sucks at this this and this. Um, and he's got a hot he, girlfriend, pretty cool truck, yeah. and <laughs> all the above. Drinks good whiskey, all yeah. that stuff's in there. You can't believe it. It's it's a constant it's a constant screener. Even on the weekends, like the instructors would sometimes come out with you uh, and play it cool, but you know they're judging you constantly. So mm -hmm. if you're that idiot that just got blitzed on the weekends, they're like noted. Yeah, um, I, I thought, that's not the point. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, because you know, when we were at five, we got pretty good at that. We, you know, had a full size bar built in the into in the deal, into the high bay, yeah. and one of our platoon guys got hit by a train. Yeah, okay. not, I was in that. I was in that van. I know. That's why I brought it up. Oh, <laughs> right. I was a brand new guy, and, and the uh, second. That's guy why I brought it up. And, and we're sitting in this van coming back from Shaw's, and uh, he's driving, and the train's coming. We've all been drinking. Obviously, we just kind of one guy chose to be driving. Um, he goes, I'm going to beat this train. And everybody's like, no. And he floors it. And that train clips the back of the van and spun us around. And we kind of rolled over. And we're like, what the hell? We you got a, hit by a train? Yeah. Hit by a train. Isn't that great? Oh my it's a great story. God. And they live, too. He's telling it wrong, though, because there was a new guy behind the wheel. And they were they were like, you fucking new guy, you better beat this train. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, he, he, didn't, uh, he didn't stay in the team very much. Oh my god, man! Dude, that was yeah, the funniest. I was laying there. I was Did sitting next to. Did anybody get hurt? No, no I hurt. Nobody we got hurt. All pee Freaking, ourselves, pretty much. But uh, it just it messed up that van and obviously trying to beat a train. Brand new 15 pack silver, right? Yeah. Had that freaking okay. plates. For anyone Good. listening, do not try to beat oh, a train. No. Oh, we already did gosh. it. Yeah, y'all okay, can. I got to do some. Uh, I'll something. never forget. Okay, so what team did you get assigned to? Or. Um, I, I just I got assigned to the command. I won't speak too much about it, yeah. but uh, no, it was a great, good group of guys. My first um, troop chief was Lash. Mm, oh, nice. So, yeah. 
So yep, I was with uh, Lash. Like and... one of the toughest looking humans. He looks the part. <laughs> he look. He looks. Some terrifying. of our guys do look the part, and and are and are the part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. him. Oh. Like, if there was an action figure of what you, you imagine would think... being at Buds when that guy was instructed there, I, I would. I don't know. Like I had John like Austin. some of these guys. I... <laughs> you had Johnny. Yeah, and he was a psycho He's terri... with a best busted <laughs> leg. Bro, he. I thought when we were filming the movie, he was out there, and all the actors and all the team, all the actors were scared to death of him. Like, hey, we we're kind of scared of this guy, and all the team goes, "We, we are too." Yeah, of no. lash. Oh, no. uh, and, oh. Lash. and lash, both lash. of them suckers, oh, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah, no. We do have them. We yeah. got guys in the teams where you know guys would come up to us, and be like, "Even bad, I mean, my like, man." Once, but he was. I just remember thinking, "Wow, you are literally what every human thinks that." And SEAL Team 6 looks like. You could package up an action figure from that command and be last. Yes. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> and the name. I right. might have been part of the protocols to get in the community. Like, does he, look, does he fit into does this he mold? This yeah, name. he does. And it goes next door. He's like, yeah, it's him, man. You know? No, they, they, like each, um, I, I heard a Sean Ryan deal recently where he was talking to one of the guys from Delta. And like, same thing with those squadrons. Each each the, each squadron had their own personality. So yep. you know which, mm -hmm. who's who by just how they carry themselves. Carry themselves. You don't even have to have a patch on or anything. Nope. So. Um, going through green team, you kind of see who those people are and you get stuck with there. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I got, I got with Lash, Lash was my first, uh, troop chief. Um, all right. So when'd you come out of there? Out of command? 2009. I got, oh, I, I went there in 2009 and, uh, I left the command in 2017 when I medically retired. Well, Here's, yeah, let's, sorry. What? Say what you want to talk about? Oh, you don't want to talk about it. I thought you said. Well, saying, we could, well, so we can talk about yeah. some of the stuff I did there, my injuries. And that's uh -huh. where I got hurt. Oh, yeah. Um, that's when I saw you guys again because uh, Morgan was doing his officerly duties, so he went over to the East Coast. Um, How did you when get I first hurt? Met you. Yeah. Uh, so skydiving. So second trip with the squadron. Um, kind of had a, a high winds at altitude and no winds on the ground, so they dropped us off. All, like only, I think only three guys out of that that lift actually made it to the drop zone. Everyone else was like spread everywhere else. Um, I, I got put over a bunch of trees. It's like my first. Not my first, but like my tenth or fifteenth actual free fall. So my experience just, it's school, right? Yeah. Um, and so I was like over all these trees. I wasn't getting the penetration. I wasn't going nowhere. You had a DZ. I was kind of freaking out and had the little radio. And I was like, hey, I don't think I'm going to make it to the DZ. And they're like, we'll find a good spot to land. And I'm looking around. There's like nothing but trees. And so I was like, ah, this is just going to suck. So I kind of looked at this little pond, and my plan was to either land in the pond or land in the this road that was right next to the pond, but they still had trees as in Florida, and these huge, stupid trees that are like 70, 80 feet tall. Uh, so I'm trying to maneuver my way there, and I was like, all right, I'm going to go in these trees and get stuck in a tree, because that's what they tell you, all the little deals, hey, you're going to get stuck in a tree, you know, just remain calm, stay there, radio somebody, they'll come basically drag you out. So I go and... Uh, hit this tree instead of getting stuck in it it collapsed my chute and i fall straight down to the pavement oh my gosh um so as soon as i start picking up speed because i'm going through these tree limbs i'm trying to reach these tree limbs like feet and knees together i do the whole army thing like oh prepared peel left and uh i did more than peel left i shattered my left leg oh and when my i hit gosh. and tried to you know roll over the side i hit so hard i shattered my left leg and i broke my back mm. and i'm laying there on the pavement just devastated because it was an excruciating amount of pain. I didn't just like break it, like shattered all the bones in my lower leg above my ankle. Uh, Corman runs up to me. Who is it? Uh, I don't know who this is. It was an attachment. Oh, okay. I'm like, oh, who'd you got? Yeah. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't a team guy, Corman. It was a regular Corman. Um, he runs up to me. He goes, hey, are you all right? And I was like, no, I'm 100% sure I broke my left leg. And he, he grabs my, my leg and he pulls off my shoe from the heel and just rips it off instead of cutting it off. And yeah. of course, it's like a bag of broken glass, my leg is. So everything's just. Yeah. Oh. And he's like, ah. And I'm screaming at him. I'm, I want to punch him, but I can't because my back's broke. So I can't really move either. Um, and then, you know, the rest of the guys come in. That Corman ended up getting fired from that incident. But uh, no, I like, shattered my leg. And it was like two months after making it through. It was January 2010 when it happened. I just made it through Green Team, just got assigned to the squadron. And I was like, I can't believe this. Like, I all my you know, path to this point is it's null and void. Like I'm done. Like there's no way I'm able to go back to the command with this, this injury. Cause the surgeon was all like, yeah, um, you're never going to walk again. Kind of deal. We're going to try to repair you or whatnot. And I was depressed. I didn't bathe or move from the bed for a while. Oh my God. That's when, uh, that's when Morgan showed up. Cause, uh, 
Pete Van Hoosier was the CEO of the command at the time, like the command command. That's freaking guy. How about him? Um, and he he comes to visit me, but Morgan had come in, and he goes, Joe, you stink. <laughs> and so Morgan picked me up and is uh, Ben Ives with him too, and they yeah, both boss. shoved me in the shower, and they both hold me in the in the shower in the in the Portsmouth and showered me off. Like you need to, you stink. You, oh you need to gosh. stop being so depressed. <laughs> That comes with its own odor, too. Yeah. That was in 2010. 2010, yeah, January 2010. So I spent... You had a few guys in there, right? In uh, the hospital? No, nah, that was just me at that time. Okay. Morgan went in. When did they, when was that? Later that year. That's right. Because he, he fell from that helicopter. Yeah. Oh, my God. And then and somebody else. Maddie. Yep. That's right, Maddie. Thank you. Okay. And Ben Singer. Yeah, and Singer. That's right. Um, you were the first one. Yeah. That was like January 2010. I was there for... Almost three months because they had multiple surgeries. I had this, you know, big erector set attached to my leg. Like I destroyed what bones I had, and they basically put plates and screws to. So it just blew up your tib fibs, your yeah. femur, all that. Just yeah, it was it was disgusting. Okay. HelloFresh isn't just a meal kit; it's a lifestyle upgrade. Whether you're aiming to save money, eat better, or simply just reduce stress. HelloFresh has you covered. With farm fresh ingredients and chef crafted recipes delivered straight to your door, every meal is a step towards a more delicious and hassle free year. As a healthy and pretty busy person, I used to dread spending so much time at the store or even just searching up new recipes. But since switching to HelloFresh, I could not be happier. I'm constantly trying all these unique and flavor packed meals. And all I have to do is open my front door and follow the directions. It's the best. Are you ready to experience the convenience and variety of HelloFresh yourself? Visit HelloFresh.com slash TNQ free and use code TNQ free for free breakfast for life. Enjoy one complimentary breakfast item per box while your subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash TNQ free. Don't forget to use the code TNQ free and discover why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit today. But they were uh, able to fix it. They put it. it back together and they're like, hey, we'll do rehab and stuff. We got to keep you, you know, through that. Being at the command, I had some of the best physical therapists the world could find because those guys, they go out and they'll steal them from professional NFL teams, Olympic teams. And yeah, how about that? These guys were phenomenal. That's uh, a place so, to get hurt then, right? Yeah. Oh, if you had to get hurt in the teams, that'd be the place to get it because uh, they take care of you. No, but like eight months later, I was deployed again in Afghanistan. Wow. Oh, my gosh. They fixed you up good. Yeah, kind of. And part of it was I was just like, no, I'm good. I was in a lot of pain. Yeah. Grind through it. But I was like, I saw the ability to stay in the career path I was in, being at the command. I was like, there's no way I'm going to let a little bit of pain and discomfort prohibit me from. So this all it took was the one to going back. That's yeah. the way I felt too. I was like, yeah. and that's your, that's a qual on the teams. It's like, yeah. just as long as they see you try to go back. Yep. But physically, you could do the job. Yeah. You just no. had to bite through the pain. Yeah, had a nice little ankle brace and and definitely nightly routines to make sure that it yeah. could survive the next day kind of deal. But no, did the job. Deployed to Afghanistan uh, that Christmas. Wow. Christmas deployments. I was used to it being at Team Five. Mm -hmm. we, uh, yeah. The holiday deployments. So. Rolled right back into that and was in a Kaust right after the suicide bomber took out Jeremy Wise and those CIA guys. Wow. So then you have a full career really at Dev Group. Yeah. Um, so deployed a few times with them. 2012, uh, luck strikes twice with me and I shattered my right leg. Um, Not to thing. be outdone. Yeah. Uh, it was... It's, it's frustrating because before that, you know, I did like three, 400 other free fall jumps, you know, at night on nods, strange locations. Like we'd go do unknown DZs uh, up in Colorado on these basins in Arizona and stuff next to the Grand Canyon. Like if you miss this, this unknown DZ, you're going off a mountain face. Um, and so I, I, you know, doing well, doing the jumping because the squadron we were in, we, we like to do our jumps in. Um, but just uh, August, 2012, we just got back from a deployment uh, and we're in Denver, Colorado doing high altitude jumping and I shatter my right leg, uh, smashed into an ISU 90. So ISU 90 or individual storage units, what? 90 cubic I feet. I forgot you. 
That's right. Or I did hear that and wanted to forget it. Yeah, it was it like was a way civilian storage unit, like the one you yeah. got out here in, oh the, in my the front. Oh gosh! Of, but uh, cut it in half. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. What? So next to the, the drop zone, we had uh, all our ice nineties full of our gear and whatnot. Um, obviously, we were avoiding that. Uh, it was happened. This kind of similar to the the first time it happened because it was Friday, last jump of the day. Same thing happened in in twenty ten. Was it's Friday, last jump of the day. We were about to be done. Go to you know. Hooters and get some wings and stuff like that, and I break my leg. To send this one, same thing. Friday, it's like last jump of the day. We're gonna be done for the weekend. Guys are gonna go skiing and whatnot. is is supposed to be, a, you know, good good relaxed weekend before we back to the beach. Um, and I'm trying to do like flat turns, and I wasn't really paying attention to my altitude. Uh, and all of a sudden, I'm facing the ambulance, and it's like I got like like 85 feet left before I hit the ground. I'm like, crap, I need to fight my final leg. You got to have that way before that um, and clear your path. And I was going to scoot over closer to the drop zone, but other guys were coming in. I was like, man, I'm not going to smash into somebody because you smash into somebody at 80 feet, you're both going to go powder in. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to get between these two ISU 90s because I want to avoid the, the ambulance there. Um, and the rule, number one rule with anything, if you look at it, you're going to hit it. So I'm looking at this ISU 90. I got a GoPro on me. And I look at my, my hand goes like this because I'm looking at it going, I got to avoid that. But my hand starts naturally doing that and it steers my canopy in last second. Uh, originally, I wanted to like put up my arms over my face and kind of cover me because I was like, man, this is going to hurt. I'm going to smash into it, but it won't be too bad. I was moving so fast the last second. I was like, I'm throw up my legs. And that's what I did. Threw up my feet. My left leg with all the awesome plates and screws the Navy put in it before bounced right off. Oh my, my right God. leg goes, you know what? You don't have plates and screws. And my foot <laughs> broke completely off and the bone shot oh, right outside the leg. Oh my god! Shattered everything above the ankle joint as well, as well as snap off my foot. So, yeah. And the first feeling I got when I hit the ground um, was rage. I was so upset at myself because it was one of those things like that home alone feeling. I can't believe I did it again. Like I literally broke my leg and I probably, you know, all these things about my reputation and, and how I'm going to be known. And, you know, I'm the guy that shatters his legs every time he goes skydiving. Oh my god. <laughs> You are. Yeah. I'm, I mean, it is now. I accepted it now. But at the time, I was like, man, I literally We even just, got a name for you. I'm, I'm like the example they, they show. Oh. And the example they show during the jump phase with that GoPro video, what not to do and how not to be an idiot. Oh, no. Uh, but no, it shattered that right leg even worse than it did the left one. But uh, I wasn't as depressed in the hospital because I was like, yeah, I did this before. I can do it again. Mm. So same thing. Three months in the hospital, multiple, multiple surgeries. Um, it was funny because they rolled me in, uh, got the same exact room I had mm. two years prior, saw the same nurses, the same doc walks in. He goes, I couldn't believe it when they said that you shattered your leg because I was like, wait a second, we just repaired his leg two years ago. What do you mean shattered his leg? And I was like, yeah, I got another one, doc. Yeah. yeah. There's two leg. of them. There's yeah. two of them. <laughs> Good news is I can't shatter anymore. I only got two legs. Yeah, how did you work out that one side, you know? Oh, my gosh. That is crazy. Yeah. Um, so no, same thing, kind of pushed through the recovery process. Uh, this one took a little bit longer to recover. Uh, so I didn't get to deploy right away with the squadron. I had to wait a few months into it, and but I ended up making the tail end of their deployment on that one. Um, and that was uh, like 2013, 2014. Uh, deployed one more time with the command. Uh, it was actually during the big Houthi takeover. Anybody's hearing about the Houthis in the news right now. So we were in Yemen before they took over and overthrew the government. Uh, when we did that, we actually had to cut our deployment short because they it was right after Benghazi. So everybody's like, hey, they're poised to do the same thing. So let's get all the US personnel out of deal. That that deployment was hair raising in itself. But no, the Houthis took over 2015 and that was my last deployment with uh, the Navy. Mm. Worked in uh, some ops positions and such like that until I got medically retired in 2017. That's a good run. What'd you come out as? E6. Oh, me too. That's a good Best run, Best place though. to be. Yeah. Well, I, like, I got hurt every time I was up for my LPO position, and the Navy made it so regimented. They're like, you have to have this, which is weird because when we're at the command, we get stuck at these outstations, and we're doing stuff that warrant officers are doing. Mm -hmm. But being at the command, we're like, hey, this E6 guy's in charge because he's at the command. Yeah. Uh, but the Navy didn't recognize that, so they wanted wickets. And I, every time I was up for an LPO spot... Uh, I was hurt or recovering, and so they kind of skipped me over for a healthy guy, which is, you know, I would do that too. Just at, after twice, they're like, hey, you're so far behind your peers, and you're non-deployable now because you've shattered both your legs and can't officially clear you anymore. Because mm -hmm. after that 2015 deployment, 
I had to have more surgeries because the amount of stuff that we're doing overseas, running around kit and body armor and whatnot, it shifted all my hardware. Oh so I had like some God. some of the hardware inside my ankle joint. And I just kept talking. I was just being a weenie. I was like, man, I got, it feels like a ice picks in my ankle. It was different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There yeah, is right. something wrong with y'all because Marcus did the same thing with his, um, he had a fusion in his spine, yeah. in the lower spine. And he kept saying, there's something, there's something a little off. We go for an x-ray and the doctor's like, there's nothing can be off. It's fused. And yeah. it looks like, He's like little, you can't bend that rod. Yeah. It looks yeah. like a little bobby pin. And the x-ray showed that it looked like this instead of it looking like I bit this. I the shit out of it. Yeah. It was totally through bent. my spine. Yeah. And no big deal. it's a medical study now. <laughs> As we should be. Yeah. But it shows like. I just got fired up about it. I was like, yeah, it was. Now I got a big one. Y'all of the same caliber of mindset. It's competition. You can get jacked up the worst. It's and have, like, have the best crazy. attitude about it. Yeah. The, the doc was like, I can't believe you're walking. Like your your joint spaces have zero anything in it. Like the, the viscosity of the fluid that's in your joint spaces is slicker than any type of oil they've ever produced on earth. Um, because it's made that way intentionally. So even a, a, something as small as a grain of sand is excruciating. I had a full size surgical screw floating around on there, just destroying what cartilage I had left. Oh and my joint gosh. thing. I ran around that for like three or four months. Well, many more months than that because it was the whole workup process and whatnot. Do you get used to the pain, or you just fight through the pain? You every fight day? through it. Fight through so you, you it. Know, Never got used your to good it. times and bad times. Waking up and going to bed was miserable. Midday, your body kind of acclimated for a little bit, and then it just everything would swell up. So I'd wear like compression socks and ice it, and take a lot of ibuprofen. You know, ibuprofen water, and be good to go the next day. Oh my! Uh, at least gosh. I thought, anyways. But no, that, that after that last appointment I did, I'd have more surgeries, and like if you continue your job, uh, you're going to have to continue have more surgeries because the amount of stuff you demand your body to do the surgical hardware is not designed for that it's designed mm -hmm. to keep stuff still but you run around the mountains of anywhere with kit and body armor jumping on and off helicopters skydiving and stuff like that all that stuff's going to shift and you're going to continue having surgeries and you're not going to walk when you're 40 so we got to medically discharge you or retire you medically retire so have you hit 40 yet yeah I'm 41 now 41 still walking you're but still i did walking. i did have to have another surgery uh Four weeks ago. Oh my gosh, my really? Case. Yeah. It's, oh my gosh. There, he's like, yeah, same thing. Um, all the cartilage deteriorated. Uh, bone spurs start forming where the cartilage used to be because the body's like trying to figure out how am I supposed to be walking right now? I'm all set. Yeah. Hey, I, I, I'm due for one too, and I keep putting it off. Now I got an injury on the same side, different leg. Yeah. I, I guess, yeah, my big thing was I was earlier this year, I was sitting there, I'd been gritting and bearing it through the pain and whatnot. Um, I was sitting there going, man, if there's a fire in this house and I got to run upstairs, get my boys, I'm not going to be able to do it. Mm. And so that kind of panic. Run? For a second. No. Yeah. Or just get upstairs. Get upstairs. In general. Yeah. In general. Like I can't even crawl on all fours just because the amount of pain I was in for both my legs the past couple of years. So went and saw the ortho guy. He took x-rays. He looked at me and he goes, you're not walking right now, are you? And I was like, I walked in here. He goes, I can't tell how you're doing. He says, it's like bone spurs. You have no space. You have no cartilage. Like the amount of debris that's floating around your ankle joint right now, I, I'm dumbfounded. Like, Does why that you scare walking? you, like scientifically, that you shouldn't be walking, but you are? No, uh, not really. I just know that, all right, cool, I need to wait. Uh, I need to not wait as long when I'm feeling this type of pain to get it looked at. Um, I'm eventually going to have to get my ankles replaced, uh, but he said that if I were to get them replaced now, that uh, I would burn through it real fast because ankle replacements aren't heavy duty i've never even heard of an ankle replacement they usually do it for like really really old people that just want to stay mobile my gosh this, as active as i like to think i am um i would burn through it in like three to five years and have to replace it again it's just more and more surgeries man the tech they got on those legs now i know I thought our about guy's it. like hey man you just want to take the I take it at the knee cutting it off oh no <laughs> just take give me one of those fancy ones though right make me run faster yeah. well i talked to turbo and turbo same thing he got shot in the leg during anaconda yeah and uh he was going through the same kind of procedures and he's like just cut it off and he cut it off got right back into the squadrons and ran around for a little bit i mean he's doing this i thought about it for a hot second but that uh that scene from dances with bulls i was like man i can wiggle my toes and i can still move it and i was like man don't take my foot i love that movie and from uh lonesome dove when he yeah. takes that arrow on the freaking knee man yeah. he will oh okay so do you go to exos at all I went to Exos, uh, a, a side program. 
okay. once, but I, I, I've been trying to get on the Exo, Exos program down in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, but to get time for that is is is, is difficult. At the Marcus Bingo goes for me. the month of February every year. Okay. I yeah. Get it out. Fifteen years now. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I was just curious if you went because they have a great physical therapy program and surgery center that's attached. If you have to have a, he's right there. Yeah, yeah. And there's a bunch of team, bunch of us running around there, plus the athletes. Yeah, the, gotta look into that. It's really, really good. I'll look into it for you. You need to go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been um, road testing for 15 years, man. Come yeah, on. So when you get out of the teams and you medically retire, you move back to Texas. We moved back to Oklahoma. Oh, you moved to Oklahoma. So uh, back in the day when my family did the whole land rush piece, most of them settled in Oklahoma. Where? Uh, Anadarko, Oklahoma City, stuff like that. Um, so I, I found that out like later, mm -hmm. later in life. But uh, my aunt and uncle has always lived in Oklahoma. I remember visiting them when I was little after my mom died, um, seeing them. They've been in the exact same residence since my aunt was 18. She's like, well, 70 now. So mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to be close to them just because they were kind of the family I'd known. And I was kind of, at the time, I was super bitter about the uh, leaving the teams because I was frustrated. I was like, I wanted to do 20 years. That was my life. and. They were like, hey, you're going to medically retire you. We're starting the process, and I didn't have a plan afterwards. Mm -hmm. So a buddy of mine was like, hey, let's uh, let's do some firearms training in Oklahoma. And I was like, cool, I'm kind of be close to the family. So as soon as I got done uh, with Virginia Beach, I left and moved to Oklahoma. Mm. So 20, uh, 2017, I uh, went there, had uh, married for my, my third time and final time uh, to a lovely lady. Uh, we had two sons that we had in Virginia Beach. Uh, when we moved to Oklahoma, we had a third Mr. Gunner. Um, yeah, so we moved there in 2017. And that's Morgan. Yeah, Morgan. Yes. She's so pretty. Uh, she is pretty. She put I love in. watching her Instagram. She's like fun personality and super cute. I know. I try not to spend too much time in front of her because then she'll realize how pretty I am. <laughs> so, oh, I walk away constantly, man. Yeah. I, yeah, so I think it's think it's more of an assignment. Yeah. So I remember... And I don't remember what year it was, but I remember there being a lot of talk just amongst the wives and like texts going through saying that she had found out that she had, um, was it colon cancer? Is that yep. right? Colorectal cancer. So, yep, 2020, she uh, seven issues with her stomach and whatnot and kept going to emergency rooms and they're like, oh, you're just constipated. And they're like filling her with, you know, all this constipation stuff. Um, she couldn't eat and she's getting real, real like thin and sick. And she's like, there's something else wrong, something else wrong. Uh, and I was like, we should, we should go try to get a colonoscopy or something. Usually they do that for guys, check their prostate. Mm -hmm. Women's not as common. And she's, at the time she was 33. Um, you should find out they had a, a a big old tumor in the or the colon rectal uh, attached and it was kind of forming in, inside of her colon and blocking all her digestive tract and uh, that was scary uh, it you know her being 33 years old and my kids were five four and two just kind of had the same age i was yeah and that's it like was like all this flood of emotion from watching my mom die it was like all of a sudden i was like man i'm like reliving my childhood yeah um that's your dad yeah that's my dad. Oh my gosh, so that I, had to be terrifying for you. I was you. already, it was, it was, I was scared shitless. Um, I was already depressed from being out of teams anyways. Wasn't really assimilating very well. So my mental headspace before that was crappy. Um, but you know, finding out that news, I was just like, I was, you know, didn't know what to do. It was like defeated kind of deal, I guess. Um, but it, it scared me, I guess, to not think about all the other crap that I had going on mentally because I didn't want to, I didn't want that to, I didn't want to turn into my dad the way he kind of just fell apart and didn't take care of us as kids. And that's all I could think about was my kids kind of going through the same exact crap that I went through. So, um, I was scared. No, we, we didn't know cause it was like stage three. Um, they had to do all that radiation and chemo and still had to do surgery and, um, wasn't sure until after all the procedures were over, you know, what the outcome was going to be because it's one of those things that cancer is scary. Like mm -hmm. it could, you can get it all at once uh, out and be good or it could come back, come back 10 times worse. Um, so now nah, I was, it was a tough, tough, probably one of the toughest points of my life besides, you know, watch my mom die. That had to be. I mean, especially 
because of you being in the position of your dad and already having that um, depression coming out of the teams and not feeling a part of anything. So, yeah. Um, but I feel like as a family, y'all handled it really well, um, like supporting her and the treatments look like from outside looking in. <clears throat> She's okay, right? Everything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she, after they, the all the chemo and radiation and the surgeries, uh, she so far so good. We like to say that. Um, we've got to get her in to get a, another screen in soon because it's been a minute since we've done that. But luckily, we came out on top of the process of that. Uh, definitely kind of changed her outlook on life. Mm-hmm. Um, no, yeah, that was uh, definitely a process, and she has the warrior scars to show for it. It does that yeah. when death shows up. Mm-hmm. I, want, I had to start looking at my life as, and this is the best piece of advice I got, was was an assignment for us. I was like, you and I take pain for fun. Yeah. I was like, but who we live with and who we watch out for in their lives as they're going through it, they're going through their pains. We're there to help them get through it. Yeah. Because we can. Like anybody can get in pain with somebody and be like, oh, this is terrible. This sucks. This, that, and the other. Or you can send one of us in. Yeah. And the minute it gets tougher, like, this is what I was designed for. Yeah. I would have I would have gave anything in the world trade lies with her at that point in time because. That's the hardest thing for us. Like, hey, like, man, just give me that pain. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll no take big deal. Like, no, it, no, I, I got to take it. And it was one of those things, like, all the crap that I've been through and the, the broken bones and the, you know, explosions and whatnot and burn pits and all that stuff. I was like, man, I, I figured I'd be definitely the one developed some type of weird sickness that no one could figure out what was that going on. But, what is that? I guess it scares it out of us. Yeah. It didn't want to get in there. Yeah. <laughs> you guys have wrecked this inside of this thing, man. I don't want that. It's too scary. Well, I believe in the power of prayer for sure. And there were so many people, including me, praying for her during that time. And um, it is definitely a God moment, like how that just was full circle for you. Yeah. And, uh, had some lifestyle changes at the time because um, being before that, I was super depressed obviously drinking all the time, you know, no fitness r- regiment, no routine. Um, I was all self-absorbed at the moment. And then when that happened, you know, everything from my childhood kind of come back and I, I basically changed how my, I was living at the moment to make sure I could take care of her. So mm-hmm. like whatever I had going on internally, externally, I kind of definitely was like, it doesn't matter compared to this. Like yeah, she needs me to be there hundred percent. So well, she's tough. She's tough as nails. Hell yeah. <laughs> she still puts up with me every day. So, <laughs> Well, your story is incredible. From the time you were five years old faced with extreme adversity. I mean, most kids are just scared to go to sleep in the dark. and But they've got their parents a couple of rooms away. But to go to sleep and not knowing where your siblings are and being ripped from your your mom being ripped from you forever and your dad you don't know what's going on is he dead uh he passed away a couple years ago so when i was 18 uh in graduating high school casa we were talking about uh, my casa worker was awesome he helped get a private investigator and we located him uh so when i graduated high school he was there saw me graduate uh i think that his lifestyle choices and the death of my mom really messed him up he got real hardcore into drugs and alcohol and we tried to help him out, like saying, hey, dad, we forgive you. You know, don't hold on to this. Like, we're all adults now. You have grandkids. Let's, you know, try to move on from this. And his addictions and his struggles were just a whole lot for for anybody to handle. Um, he ended up getting hit by a car high one night, uh, and he ended up getting both of his legs amputated, uh, or one of his legs amputated. And he got put in a retirement home uh, in, like, January 2020, he had a stroke and didn't recover. Ended up passing away. Um, I was the only one there beside his side. Mm. So I let him know that, you know, I love him. I mean, I remember the last four or five months he was completely sober because once he got hit by that car, he was kind of in this special rehabilitation care unit. Um, So he didn't have access to drugs and alcohol. And he's like soberest I've ever seen him in my life. Um, We had some great conversations and great interactions, and it was great just to see him just tell me how much he loved me and, you know, how sorry he was. And I kept telling him, Dad, it's it's not a big deal. Like, I'm just glad you're still here. Like, he could have died. That was before he had a stroke. Um, yeah, I would go see him, like, at least once a week because I kind of put him close to me up in uh, Dallas area. 
Yeah, and uh, got to spend another Thanksgiving and Christmas with him, which is good. He got to see his grandkids open up Christmas presents, and he passed away that January with a stroke. Wow. Total full circle. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, what about your brother and sister? Did they get to see him, or did they ever forget uh, him? Th- they got to see him a little bit. Uh, Tiffany, my sister. She did. Yeah, right down here. And, uh, so traveling back and forth, she did when she could. But <laughs> Dennis, same thing. He was a truck driver at the time, so he was always on the road. Uh so he, I mean, same thing. He did. He could see her, see him when he could. Uh, and when did your uncle pass away, the team guy? Uh, so my uncle passed away in 2009. When I was going through Green Team. That's like uh, so we, like we kind of located him and found him. He was actually in the Houston area, um, and I actually talked to him on the phone a few times because uh, he was he was super stoked. Another family member uh, in the teams, and so we exchanged you know Frogman stories, which was a good little bonding experience. Uh, same thing, similar. He had a stroke too, and I found that out when I was going through Green Team. I was trying to make it back, uh, so I told the command. They were cool about it, like, "Yeah, I go see your uh, uncle and stuff." And I tried to make it back before he passed, but unfortunately, before I could actually see him face to face, he passed away as well. Mm. What a cool story! The whole, your whole life. I'll get, all of our guys got one. You got one for sure. Yeah, you've got a. Great... Fact that you keep stepping up for it, and now that we we're into the role where we have to teach and give back. I mean, the kids are coming online, and then we have this ability. I mean, the only way people really listen is if you've had time in their in their arena. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you definitely have a unique one. Yeah. So, bro, I mean, keep just never, never, st- you know, never quit me, never stay down. Yeah. yeah. You're well, a perfect embodiment of that. <laughs> you are. Yeah. I appreciate it. Well, you're, you're freaking welcome. How I mean, you can, earned it. Can people follow you on? Do, are you okay with people looking Follow me you on, up on and, the instagrams yeah yeah um uh, one of the things that got me through buds and sqt and the teams and shitty situations was humor um so beardedfrogman.com um the bearded frogman on instagram i make a, a lot of stupid tank top videos because uh we'll tell about that deployment story so deployed with the, the command overseas uh every day is exactly the same marcus knows the deal there's no monday tuesday wednesday or friday it's hey are we operating tonight or not oh we're not okay we're going to work out and play video games or whatever we do if we're operating sweet we're putting our kid on we're going such a great place to be yeah it was great there was no uh, no yeah, we're talking about a lot it pisses me off they yeah. don't get to do it our whole lives yeah like i wasn't i wasn't stressed out if the weekend was coming or whatnot i was like i was like man i hope we operate tomorrow i was never stressed is. yeah and that, I was never stressed. Like I ate, workout, operated, and sometimes slept. Uh, that was great. Uh, but we started doing this thing in 2012 where we'd wear tank tops on Fridays just to kind of mark the occasion. It was, <laughs> hey, you were. DJ has to be in on that. Oh, yeah. DJ was part of it as well. We tank tops all the time. We'd, because uh, we were big meatheads overseas. We lifted big and, and just, you know, big burly guys with beards. So. Like, hey, we'll wear tank tops, we'll work out in the gym. The Ranger kids were next to us. They were all pissed off because, you know, they still had to kind of go with the Army standards. They had relaxed haircuts, but they're still Army guys. Um, so they were always jealous. We'd walk around the compound because usually at the command, no one talks to you and messes with you mm-hmm. at any place you're at overseas because you're there to do a job. We'll walk around with tank tops is kind of a funny deal. So we had a briefing one Friday, um, and I just was kind of going in thinking it was the same. We get a daily brief where, like, hey, this is what's going on. You're either going out tonight or not. Um, but I guess it was a big target that night. No one really passed the word. So everybody was dressed up in their cami tops because the commander of JSOC was on the two-way television screen, monster me- megathon. So his face is big up there. I didn't know there was a two-way camera at the time. I just thought we were just getting intel briefing. So I walk in in my tank top. My team leader looks at me in, in great disappointment. And so does my troop chief. And everybody's kind of standing there looking at me. And, of course, I got this big head of, of Votel. He's a four-star general looking at me. You know, and he's kind of looking at me. I kind of noticed that he was looking at me because he can see me. And I look at everybody. I was like, what? It's Tank Top Friday. Like, <laughs> and of course, I didn't shot. get the damn memo, yeah, obviously. So I, was like, <laughs> so I look like a jackass and I totally thought I was going to get my, my PP spanked hard for that. Um, but I was told, hey, I need to be more professional. What's up with your TPS reports, man? You, yeah. You, so, but you, looking back. You, you know, I'm talking about like the happens. funny, but in the moment, I'm like, crap, I really messed up. Like, I'm going to have to have to really do some crappy work. I mean, even at the command, if you look like an idiot, you embarrass somebody, you got to do some crappy work. So, um, no, Tank Top Friday kind of was a thing, and uh, it marked the occasion. It was kind of a funny thing. I always got semi-made fun of it uh, back in 2012 for it. So, um, I try to make some videos, kind of keep that that lighthearted humor. That's kind of get me through all my depressing, shitty situations growing up as a kid. Like, I was a goofball in school. I was always the kid that was 
people would laugh at. And um, as smart as I was, people thought I was stupid just because how, how silly I acted. It's funny because my nine-year-old Blake is the same way. Like he's just 100% goofball, but super smart, like beyond his years and smart. His teachers love him and hate him at the same time because he's stubborn because he's like, I don't want to do this simple work. And like, give me something more challenging. Uh, but same thing, he's a goofball, doesn't have many friends and whatnot. But so you Tank Top Friday videos. Tank Top Friday on TikTok and Instagram. Yeah. And you're doing the uh, training for yep. GBRS. Yeah, so running the training department for GBRS, and we set up uh, the KTCs, the civilian military law enforcement training. Um, we mostly focus on, you know, the weapons and tactics side of the house, um, CQB mostly for the military and law enforcement guys. Uh, we, we try not, we don't do the CQB for the civilian folks because a lot of people try to explain to them, like, what what do you need that for? Because we've had guys call them like, we want you to teach me assaults. I want to know how to assault a building. I was like, what do you do? I'm a dentist in New York. I was like, why do you want to know how to assault a building? It's a dangerous place living in New dangerous, York. Yeah. yeah. I was like, man, I'll, I'll show you how to, you know, some home defense stuff. That's what we're, we can teach civilians. But I mean, you're a dentist. Everyone's scared of you. Yeah. yeah. It's like one of the most terrifying <laughs> things for human beings is go to the dentist. But uh, the, the civilian courses we set up are really good. Uh, like we do a whole lot of the weapon stuff and we basically give them a little exposure of what a, a good training day is. So like I said, the KTC events uh, have a mix of civilians and law enforcement guys and they always love it. It's a three-day event that we do um, down in Florida and Omaha and we're trying to look for some places actually down here in Texas. <laughs> you need land or what? Uh, it's, it's all about the facility. So we try to have like lodging and meals and everything that can be accommodating. So it's, it's, it's experience nonetheless, like we don't need just a flat land, mm -hmm. but I mean, if places are close by, as far as like hotels, um, to house like 20 guys, that's fine. But usually we try to take control of their whole day. Like they'll mm -hmm. come in at seven o'clock, we'll do a workout. Um, and then we'll eat breakfast together. Kind of like I mentioned before. And it's like all of that's training. Like they're asking questions constantly. We're interacting, kind of give them a peek inside of the the world of what we used to live in hmm so interesting well thank you for coming yeah, on Thanks and doing this, man. driving down here oh my pleasure thanks for having me finally you know? yeah that's awesome it's always good to see you mark you too brother <laughs> happy new year man this is the team never quit podcast, podcast. don't buckle up buttercup <laughs> <laughs>